We're here at Chariot Sedek in Los Angeles. We want to thank Rabbi Rosenberg, Rabbi Schwartzman, and the wonderful Kahil of Sharit Sedek. And we're going to be broadcasting the Kinos, and then Rabbi Rosenberg is going to be giving a shear to those of you listening at home or across the world. We also, for those of you who are listening, from the young Israel of Woodmere to Rabbi Weinrib, we're now at the second half of the day, and we're continuing the program here from Los Angeles from Sharit Sedek. The role of the Kinos, to a great degree, if we could use the analogy between Avelis Yeshana and Avelis Hadasha, in a new Avelis, if God forbid someone loses a loved one, what's the role of a Hespade? A Hespade very often gets translated as a eulogy. It's not a eulogy. A eulogy is, is a big Misha you know, He had a great golf game. He played twice at St. Andrews in his life. Oh, you should have seen his collection of single malts. He was the best single malt drinker there was. That's a Misha Beirach. A Hespade, a Hespade is to convey the sense of deprivation. When we lose someone, God forbid, a parent, a sibling, a spouse, a child, and when a community loses a member, we're crippled. We're lost. There's a real sense of deprivation, and we won't be the same. The way this individual engaged or perfected this mitzvah, the way this individual took care of those who no one else took care of, it's to convey that sense of remorse, and it's to bring about tears and a real sense of heartache. That essentially is what the kinos are. In the realm of Avelis Yeshana, why is it called Avelis Yeshana? Because the Chur ben Abayis, the destruction of the temple, didn't happen this year. The loss of the six million Kedoshim did not happen now. It took place in the 40s. The loss of 100,000 during Tach between 1648 and 1653, when Chimelnitsky and the Ukrainians, they brought in the Tartar mercenaries and they went throughout the Ukraine, they went throughout Poland, they went throughout Lithuania and destroyed Eastern European Jewry. None of this is something that happened this year. But each and every year, as the Kalir says, miyamim yamima, each and every year we go back and we experience the loss. This morning, every Jew is in what we call the state of aninus, or mi shemesa mutalafanov. What the Gemara refers to is someone who's dead is in front of them. It doesn't mean literally the corpse is in front of us. It means it's the stage of the death before the funeral, before there's any sense of closure. And that's when we say the hespedim. When is a hesped said? At the funeral, before the sense of closure, before the sense of finality, before the burial. That's what the kinos are. Every Jew, every Jewish man, woman, and child today is an aninus. We're in the state of Misha, Mesa, Mutalafanov. And the kinos, through the help of the Kalir, the help of the great Rishonim that we'll be saying, we relive, we relive, and we re experience the loss, the loss of the big Mikdash. And we're going to talk about what does that mean. Of course, we are not mourning the loss of a building, of, of sticks and stones, of no matter how beautiful the cedar wood. That, that King Solomon imported from, from Lebanon. That's not, what we're, that's not our loss. A loss is the loss of a loved one, of Silu Kashchina. The fact that, it, that that imminence, that providential relationship that existed between ourselves and between the Rebona Sha'olam. Why is it, by the way, that we observe Tisha B'Av and not the 10th of Av? As you know, the destruction started in the afternoon of the 9th, and the majority of the destruction took place tomorrow, not today. Why is it today that we suffer? Because what we're mourning is Silo Kashrina. We've lost that intense providential relationship with the Ribbono Sha'olam. And we plead and we do tshuva and we try to come back and restore that relationship. The Yerushalmi that we quote every year, the Yerushalmi from Yuma, that any generation called Dor, any generation where the Mikdash is not rebuilt, is not restored, meaning we haven't restored that relationship, it's as if it were destroyed in that generation. And that's what we're lost. That's the loss that we are mourning. The loss of our Kedoshim, those who died, the innocents who died, our Kiddush Hashem, and the loss of the intimacy, the close relationship, the Hashra's Hashchina with, our, with the Almighty. We're going to be starting this morning on Kinna Yud, and you have it, as Rabbi Schwartzman said in, your, in the list here, depending on which Kinna you have. Because in the video this afternoon, that's the focus, we're going to go fairly briefly in our, in our introductory remarks for this kina, and we're going to also going to go somewhat briefly in the analysis. 
If any of you have been to Yad Vashem, and if you haven't, you must see the new Yad Vashem, the way that it's been developed educationally. But there's one particular area in Yad Vashem that, this, that reminds us of this kinna. It's called the Valley of the Communities. Whoever developed it, it was absolutely brilliant. Because what happens in the Valley of the Communities? The goal is to get lost, to get caught up in, 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 in just, whether it's lost in Romania, lost in Lita, lost in Belarus, lost in Germany, in Poland, in Galicia. Each of these areas have their own area where you absolutely get lost and confounded in. And in each area, the large cities, a Warsaw, a Krakow, a Vilna, a Frankfurt am Main, a Hamburg, they're in big, big print. They're engraved into the stone, the Jerusalem limestone. Medium-sized towns are in medium print, and small shtetlach, small, small dwarfs or villages are in, are in small. And you know what happens when you come out of that? You realize there were thousands and thousands of communities, Jewish communities, precious Jewish communities, and each and every one of them had their own special minhagim. Any of you who've gone to Breuer's, the, the Masora of Rav Shamshin Befal Hirsch in Washington Heights, and you see that for each holiday, there's a different nusach for a chatzi kaddish. There's a different nusach, I'm sorry, nigun, I apologize, a different nigun for a chatzi kaddish, a different nigun for a kedusha. And the same is true, for instance, many of you go to, are in the shul, perigimel of, of Echa. It's laid according to the same nigun of the first prakim. But the Ukrainian Jews, many of the Galiziana Jews, they had a different nigun for the third parak of Eicha, Ani HaGever. What was the third parak? It's the eyewitness account. It's Yirmiyahu HaMelech in those short staccato psukim, painful, harsh psukim. I can't handle long pasuk. I can't handle so many developed ideas. It's so painful. All I can grasp is a short idea. It's a different nigun. And the same is true of how you observe the nine days, and the same is true of how we observe Shabbos, what songs we sing, what our special minhagim of Kabbalah Shabbos are. And the same tr is true of every holiday. And the same is true of, of how the davening takes place in the shul, what, what Shavuos is like in the shul, what Simchas Torah is like in the shul. Hundreds of major cities, thousands of communities were lost, and they each had their own Gedoli Yisrael. This little community in Galicia had a great rav, Babad. Who was that? The great Minchas Chinuch. You go and you went to a city, Tarnov in Poland. Tarnov, Poland, there were 66,000 was a population before the Nazis came in 39. Of that 66,000, 44,000 were Jews. Ger Stieblach, Misnagdim, Mizrahi, Zionist Schuls, Belze Stieblach, Great Litvisha Gaonim, whose influence in Talmidim established parts of Tarnov. It was rich. Vilna. In Vilna, the streets were empty on Atisha B'Av. They were empty on Yom Kippur. You know why they were empty? Because everyone was in shul. And each of those shuls had its own unique... Not everyone followed the Min Hage Hagra. Certain of the shuls did. Reb Chaim Ozer's base medrash, Reb Chaim Ozer Grodzinski, the Gadol Hador. And all of that is lost. It's not just the people. You know, we use this term six million, and it just, it, it, we can't comprehend it as human beings. And here in this kina, kina yud, what's being described? We in Israel, we're called the mamleches kohanim. What does the ribono sholom, what does God say to us before the covenant that separates us, that makes us a unique, distinct nation? It says, Vatem tiyu mamleches kohanim v'goy kadosh. If we're this nation, and Kohanim does not mean a priest. A Kohen means an educator, a role model. If our job is to be the role model, the educator to the nations, who's going to educate us? Who's going to transform? Who's going to inspire? Who's going to develop us into that position of being a role model to the nations? It's our Kohanim. And there was a network of Kohanim, as you know. The Kohanim were not involved in investment banking and in real estate development. They were not involved in law. They were not involved in the trades. They were paid the taxes, the Chav Dalad Matnos Kahuna, the 24 different taxes. 
And with that, they were able to survive and live. And their job was to educate and to transform us. The whole model that we have here in California of the UC system and of the public school system, it comes straight out of the institution from the Torah of the Matnas Kahuna. That everyone else sets aside taxes, that we can have a group that educates, inspires, transforms the rest of us. And you know what? These towns were throughout Israel. We're going to go here in this kina, and the Rav said that had we not had the Kalir, we wouldn't have even known. From the Gemara, we know three or four of the matnos, of the various Arei Kahuna, these, these cities. Now, now, let me explain what I mean when we say the cities of the Kahuna. A Kohen could live, as you know, anywhere. But the idea was that the Jewish nation was broken up into Chav Dalad Mishmaros, 24 different groups, 24 different groups. And at, once every 24 weeks, the Kohanim, accompanied to a certain degree by Leviim and Yisraelim from those communities, would travel to Yerushalayim, and they would do the Avodah. They would be in Jerusalem once every 24 weeks, broken up into Batei Av, that a particular Kohen would work only one day of the week that he was there. But these, these communities represented different areas of the Galil, the Jordan Valley, the coastal plain, represented the Negev, represented larger towns, and they would come to Yerushalayim, and they would represent us. And we'd have no idea about the different centers of Kohanim and the different educational infrastructure had it not been for this kina. And it's a tragedy, because that profound, developed methodology of educating the Jewish people throughout the length and breadth of Israel, it was all destroyed. Those communities, those towns were all destroyed. I'll use an analogy. If we had that kind of a network in America when the survivors from the Shoah came, or forgetting even before the, before the survivors came, during the great influence and influx of, of Eastern European Jews from the eight, late 1880s through the 19 teens, when we had literally hundreds of thousands of Jews coming as immigrants, well, you know what? A hundred years later, their great grandchildren are no longer Jewish. They've intermarried and assimilated. You know how that happened? You know how that happened? That started not in 1980, not in 1970, not in 1990. That started because we didn't have an infrastructure. We didn't have a system that could educate, could develop, could nurture them. Is thinking, engaging Jews. And what happens after 100 years? After 100 years, we lose 60% of our people. 60% of our people is being lost because we didn't have this. This is what we are mourning for in this Kina Yud. The whole infrastructure of those towns of Kohanim. Echa Yashba Chabat Salas Hasharon, Kina Yud. The Damam Ron Mipi No Searon. There's a debate between the Ramban and the Rambam. The Rambam holds that after the, after the Midbar itself, who carries the Aron Kodesh? No longer the Vim, but the Kohanim. The Kohanim who would say this. The Damam Ron Mipi No Searon. Vino Mishmarosayhem Kohanim Bene Aron. No, like from Na Venad, they fled. We mourn and we plead and we cry out to the Almighty, but he says, We're going to come back to this in the 34th Kina. It was the execution by his fellow Jews of Zechariah Hanavi, not Zechariah from the Bayis Sheni, the one that we have 14 chapters, 14 prokim of, but Zechariah from the Bayis Rishon, who was executed on Yom Kippur that fell on Shabbos in the base of Mikdash. The Navi, the prophet of God, a Kohen, a prophet of God, was executed by his own people. So we sit and we plead and we cry out, God, how could you have, Almighty, Rebono Sholem, how could you have allowed this to happen? The Kalir tells us, the al damo because of the slaughtering of his blood, and because we never did tshuva, we never came to grips with that as a people. Nishchatu parachim kitzvirim. The young kohanim were executed. Just one comment we have to make. Who suffered the most in the siege and the destruction of Yerushalayim? Both in the first bias, the first temple by the Babylonians, and the bias Shani. You know who suffered most? It was the kohanim. I mean, think for a second when you go to Israel, when you go to Yerushalayim, you go into Shar Yafa, or you go into Shar Shechem if you're a little braver. What happens from Shar Yafa or Shar Shechem to the Kotel? If you walk quickly, it might take you 12 minutes. If you're a slow walker, it might take you 20 minutes. 
Do you understand that from the time the siege was broken, let's take Bayashani on the 17th of Tammuz, it took three weeks for the Romans to destroy the Mikdash. That means that there was Jewish blood, blood of Kohanim, who were fighting. They were fighting for the Mikdash. They were fighting for Yerushalayim, being slaughtered every step of the way. How did it take the Romans? The Romans had four legions during the Bayashani. How did it take them three weeks to get from Shar Yafo to, to the base of Mikdash? Because there was hand-to-hand -hand combat every inch of the way. And who was that? That was the Kohanim. They suffered, and their loss was greater than the typical Jew. Many of the Jewish communities we know, we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, they, they gave up, probably rightfully so. They didn't have an obligation to, to fight to the death. Places like Tsipori survived, and it ultimately became a center for Jews, and it ultimately became the place where the Mishnah was edited, where the Sanhedrin sat, because they gave up. Yushalayim didn't give up. The Kohanim fought with their last breath. And that's why thousands and thousands of Kohanim were slaughtered. That's this line here. Nishchatu prachim kitzvirim. Venadu kitziparim kanei tziparim. Galsa me'artza kalam mikushata. That beautiful bride, right? The Jewish people described adorned in beauty. Because What was the beauty of the Jewish people? The Torah, the mitzvahs. Why bavon maizvos shmita? Because of because of our arrogance. Instead of saying this is God's land, and essentially we're sharecroppers, even though my name might be on the deed, on the title, I'm a sharecropper, and God has conditions. I can work the land, I can develop the land, on the condition I give truma, give maiser ishan, maiser sheni, maiser ani. No, we didn't do that. In the Shemitah year, instead of laying it lie fallow and using that as an opportunity to grow, using it as a sabbatical, no, it's my land, I control it, and we didn't listen. If you look at, at the English, the famine, the siege, etc. This phrase, the, the ways, the derech to the heichal has become silent. Any of you have gone, they've discovered in the area of the Gush Etzion, what they call, they call it derech avot. What is derech avot? It doesn't mean from Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Derech avot in the Gush Etzion is... They had a whole sophisticated highway system. The Jews from all over the world would come to Yerushalayim for Pesach, for Sukkot, for Shavuos. Specifically Pesach. You know, Josephus writes, and Josephus Flavius writes how, how you had over a million Jews coming from all over the world. Remember, Yerushalayim in the time of the Bayashani is not the Jerusalem that we have today. You don't have that huge expansion to the west, the huge expansion to the south, to the north. Yerushalayim in the time of the, the Bayashani was much smaller. And over a million Jews would come to observe the Pesach. It was a sight to be seen. And the, the highways, they had, you, you know, they have mikvahs. Every so often, there's a mikvah. They had wells. They wanted to give free water and free, you know, basic uh, necessities to the people traveling. They're all, they're all desolate. From that being the scene, from that being the place where Jews from all over the world were coming, after the Churban, they all turned desolate. The Kohanim of Ayasolo. Who are the Locha Melechem? Those that's talking about the Talmud Echachamim. Talmud Echachamim were, were killed as well. Givitlu halo paros laroiv lechem. Why? The second line in each of these paragraphs gives us the insight. You're familiar with this line, halo paros laroiv lechem. What does Yeshaya Hanavi say, the famous Haftorah on Yom Kippur? I'm not interested in your fasts and your sackcloth. I'm interested that you take care of the needy, you take care of the poor, that you do justice, that instead of manipulating and abusing the poor, you take care of them. Well, what happened? The people in the position of leadership didn't take that responsibility, and we didn't take care of the Jews who were in need, who were poor. Vira'ovu v'tzamu, and in turn, what happened? We became famished. We became starved of thirst. Mimayim u'milechem. Kivitlu shteyalechem mibeis lechem. What happened is you and I know the area of the Judean hills, which we've had the miracle, and with our own eyes, we've observed the miracle of those barren mountains, the Judean hills around Bethlehem, today are the most plush and beautiful. Go to the Gush. Go to Migdalos. Go to these communities. It is absolutely a miracle how these empty barren mountains today are producing rich, rich fruits, grains, vegetables. 
Well, well the breadbasket, the Kansas or Nebraska of Israel was the area of the Judean hills. That soil was extremely fertile for producing rich bread. And what the Shealechem, the two loaves would come from there, would come from that area. And now it's all mevutal. Now it all becomes barren. Instead of wearing silver, what are we wearing? We're wearing ashes today. There was the Ner Amaravi. This happened at the time of Shimon HaTzadik. Those of you who know the Gemara in Yuma, what happened? A sign, a symptom of that special providential relationship is that even though all seven of the Neros in the menorah, the same amount of oil would be put into them, one of them would not burn out. It was called the Ner Ravi. W- which was it? One possibility is it's the middle one where the wick was facing west towards the Kodesh Kadashim. Another possibility is that the Ner Ravi was actually the second. It was west of the easternmost Ner. But whichever it was, that Ner Ravi, until the time of Shimon Tzadik, defied the laws of physics. And by the way, of course, what does the Rambam say? That, that well over 100 years after the Ner Ravi stopped burning, stopped defying the laws of physics, there was once again a sign of Hashra's Hashchina for a short time in the base of Mikdash. That, of course, was a Hanukkah story, when they only had the Pach Shoshem and one vessel of oil, and it burned for eight straight days. That, that defiance of the laws of physics, again, was a sign from the Almighty that the Jewish people had done tshuva, that they perfected themselves. The tragedy, of course, is that the Chashmonaim did not live up to who and what they should have been. First of all, as Kohanim, they should not have stayed in power. They should have handed it over and gone in, back into education. But within the family, there were civil wars, and they brought in Rome, and ultimately, which led to our defeat and our destruction. What is Yudfas? Yudfas. Those of you who have been to Tsipori in the Galilee, so you, when you look out on the mountain on Sipori, there's a wonderful, through the, the auspices of, the, of Israel Antiquities and through the auspices of the University of Michigan, there's a famous development there. And you see what, it, what a, a city it became after the Churban, both a Roman city and a Jewish city. But you'll see now a modern town called Mitzpeh Hoshaya. Many of you gone there for the experiencing the, the donkey rides and, and reliving the experience of Avram Avinu what it was like, so they have that tourist attraction. But Mitzpeh Hoshai is a wonderful city. It's an observant community. These people commute to Haifa and Tel Aviv. And then when you look to another mountain that is still barren to this day, God willing, will develop it. Yishu Aretz will develop this part of the Galilee. It's called Yudfat. Why is Yudfat important for us to know? Today it's nothing. It's still, still Kharif. You know what Yudfat is? That was the key city. That was the city that his name was Yosef bin Matisyahu, Josephus Flavius. He was what? He was the commander of the Galilean forces, of the Jewish forces of the Galilee that tried to stop the Romans. Those of you who have been to the Golan Heights, you know the war started in 66. They destroyed the first major siege that, that in the end uh, was defeated, was Gamla. After the Six-Day War, we found Gamla. We've, we've discovered it. And you saw the, the ballista, I don't know how to translate it into English, but the Romans had these things called ballista, these huge, huge balls that they, they fired with like a, a, a massive slingshot that would break the walls of the city. The Jews there would pour down hot oil as the Romans were trying to come up the walls. And it was defeated in 66. Once the, the Golan Heights and Gamla was conquered, then they went through the Galilee fairly quickly until they came to Yudfat. Yudfat is right near Tzipori, right near Mitzpeh Hoshaya. And there's a group of Kohanim. And you know there was a suicide pact. When they saw they were losing, when they saw they were being starved, they didn't have food because the Romans had sieged them, they did a suicide pact. And we're not sure that halachically that was appropriate. We don't know exactly what the Romans would have done to them. But if the Romans would have treated them the way they treated others at that time in history, so they probably would have been sold on the slave market and eventually would have been redeemed by other Jews. But they commit suicide. And Josephus, who was the head of the group, was a Kohen, he waited till everyone else had committed suicide. Then he, he handed himself over and he says, you don't have to lose Roman legions by breaking into Yudfat. But Yudfat was destroyed, it was defeated. Chazal, and if you take a look at the Rabbi Salavechik, the OU put out the Rabbi Salavechik Kinos, he says Chazal were very ambivalent. 
to Josephus. On the one hand, they probably agreed with him that suicide was not the way. He didn't commit suicide. On the other hand, look, he was, you know, what can we say? Josephus was an opportunist. When the Jews in Sipori saw this, they watched their Jew, all their fellow Jews dead. They didn't engage in the revolt. They lost autonomy over Tsipori and Nebuch. When you look at some of the mosaics that you see, was, the Roman of Odazara was brought into Tsipori. It wasn't just something that you saw in, in Caesarea, but it was brought into Tsipori. But at least the Jews could function and live as Jews in Tsipori. And eventually, as we mentioned, a hundred years later, that became the capital, capital of the remnant community after the Bar Kokhba destruction. And that's where the Mishnah was edited by Rabbi Yehuda around 180, 185. We remember back to when we said Nasev and Nishma, but now then, we refuse to answer Amen. What is answering Amen? Amen, when I say Amen to a bracha, when I say Amen to a bracha, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging, I'm acknowledging that what you said is true. Well, unfortunately, instead of saying Nasa Vanishma, def- describing and defining our commitment to the Almighty, we stopped doing that. We rejected the Almighty. La Navarosh Savu Varavu. And in the end, we ended up being satiated with noxious herbs. What are the Choseel, the prophets of God? We mocked the prophets of God. This is referring to the bias Rishon, of course. With our Tumanas, with, with the corrupt and perverted things that we did, we perverted the land. And we know from Parshas Bechukosai, the land does not tolerate. Just like, for instance, there are certain physical laws of nature. One of the physical laws of nature, and this is something Yehuda Halevi describes in, in the 36th Kina, he describes it in the Kinos of Tzion, is that Israel does not tolerate, cannot tolerate corruption and perversion. And that's what we did. Vinala Rav HaChovel, who left the captain of the ship, meaning the Almighty, our captain, our leader, left. Vanana Vak Raglav Ka'avel. And now what? Instead of wearing regular shoes, we kick up the dust like a mourner. You know where the Arbel is. The Arbel is the mountain just north of the Kinneret. It overlooks the Kinneret there. And there was, you, there's Nitai Ha'arbeli, the famous Tana that you know from Pirkei Avos. Nitai Ha'arbeli was from that community. Yado Paras Tsar The oppressor, which we'll read about in the 16th Kina, referring to Titus, he comes and he extends his control over the base of Mikdash. The Rav said on this line, very important, Really, we should have been annihilated. The fact that we corrupted and perverted our role as the Jewish people, ki kiloya, annihilation, chuyapti, I, I, the Jewish people, was mechuyav, was obligated in. But what? Ki so heishis lechibu v'nivu. Instead, God destroyed the temple. Hishlich ka'aso al eitzim vavanim. Instead of destroying the Jewish people, Jewish people, we, Am Yisrael, we survived. What was destroyed in its place? the Beis HaMikdash. That's why, if you notice in Tehillim, I believe, I'm not sure of the exact capital, I believe it's Pei Gimel. It says, Mizmor La'asaf. So the Gemara, the Medrash says, what do you mean, Mizmor La'asaf? Mizmor is a song, a song of, like we say, Mizmor Shalom Yom HaShabbos, Mizmor L'David, right? It's a positive Mizmor. What do you mean, Mizmor La'asaf? It should say, Kina La'asaf. It should be a lamentation of Asaf. So the reason it's a Mizmor is because of this principle that instead of annihilating the Jewish people, God destroyed the temple. God destroyed a structure. A building can be rebuilt. Am Yisrael survived. We're going to now read through this to ourselves. By the way, on this phrase, what is kesef acheres chipas? We were corrupt in our business dealings. We sold something. As merchants, we were selling things as pure silver. But all it was was silver plated. It was really something that was, was a, a type of earthenware, silver plated. Uvachizuk musar hurpas, veneras venopas, koin tzvas. Tzvas was one of these cities. Mimaram hishmiel nele sitaon vikani bivaron vishigaon. Shigaon is, is madness. You know, psychologically, you saw certain survivors of the Holocaust. They never were there psychologically. They were destroyed. That's what 
this does to you. Destruction turns you into a state of shigon. Ufakad alai avon no vegivon. The sins of no vegivon, the, the breaking of the pact with the givonim, what we did under Shaul HaMelech, it's something the Jewish people never made amends for. And ultimately, that sin, that corruption was stored up, and it was pakad alai. We, were, we paid for it with the destruction of the Chorban. V'na'amimon mishmeres beis ma'on. Niskad ola avon v'nichav k'hushavti anunam ibliav. V'domamti militzafzeh b'minim v'ugav. There are two types of music in the Beis HaMikdash. One music is the Leviyam and the Duchan. The Kohanim would also sing, but the Leviyam and the Duchan. And they would sing the, the, the various Tehillim. What was the other component of music? Was the, the, the different instruments. There was a very, very... The, the aesthetic experience of being in the base of Mikdash, the davening. We've all davened when you have a beautiful chazan and the whole tzibor singing in tune with the chazan and how powerful that kedusha is. Well, imagine that with musical accompaniment as well. Right? Those of you who go to the, the, the Disney Center, or those of you who go in the summer to um, the Hollywood Bowl, you had that experience in the, in the base of Mikdash. And we said at the very beginning, Domam no se, those who sang were silenced. Here, the musical instruments were silenced. So the whole avoda is, 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 is now, we, that avoda that we didn't appreciate, that we warped, that we perverted, is now, is now silenced. Venosa lai kina mishmer shishevav. Sila chali birai hore moraya valunis karli akitas moria. What happened? Our leaders, our Torah scholars, morei horaya, those who taught us, they were killed. The Chachamim, we're going to talk about in the 21st Kina, the Asar Aruge Malchus. Why Meirov Mered Umiria? Because of our rebellious ways. We didn't appreciate our scholars. Hutzaka Erum Ve'erya Mishmeris Ma'ariya. Agabi Charshu Charshim Ve'erichu Ma'anis Ve'erichu Alaycher V'chamis. What happened? The sword came out against us. Ve'erbeis Yitzomos Hasanis. And we've never recovered. We've never recovered from the Korban, the, korban, the loss of, of our, that intimate relationship with the Ribbon Olam. And we've observed many, many ta'anios over the years. Mitzuras tochnis, yotza yavanis. The Rav said there's two possible ways of what's yavanis. Either it's a town named after the Greeks. It goes back to the time where the Hellenists named the town, yavnis. Or yavanis is what? The fact that we instituted certain corrupt, perverted Hellenistic notions into our lifestyle. The problem that existed, the whole reason there was a rebellion of the Chashmonoim is because what? The Hellenistic value system said it, it put a, a priority on what? On the human body. The human body is not a means to an end. It's not a vehicle. A healthy body, the Rambam says, is a vehicle of enabling for a healthy soul. No, it became an end in itself. They wanted to have the Olympiad in Jerusalem, and the Olympiad in Antiquities was where they performed in the nude. The whole notion that they prohibited brismila, they viewed that as a maiming of the body not the completion or the perfection of the creation being God's partner. They prohibited Shabbos, right? Shabbos, which is what defined the Jewish family. All this was, was prevented. The base of Mikdash, they put idols in the base of Mikdash. They broke through the Chel. The Chel is a whole wall around, the whole area. Everyone's entitled to come to Harbais, all nations. But we have in the Turkish Museum till this day, we have a piece of the Chel where it's written in Greek, it's written in Latin, it's written in Aramaic, that until this point, you know, the nations of the world may come and participate, but at this point on is, is the Jews. All of that, they, all the institutions of the Jewish people, they destroyed and undermined. The Shabbos, the Beis HaMikdash, Bris Mila, Torah study, that's the whole notion of the dreidel, right? It's a subterfuge. For the, they were, everyone thought they were playing games, but the, really it was a way of teaching Torah to the children. All of that was destroyed. Karasi batsar li velo karav konanti bayar barav. What's the yar barav? That's referring to what, what our Muslim cousins did to us. At that time, they were not Muslims. They were descendants of Yishmoel, the Arabs. We came to them when we fled the Romans. I'm sorry, when we fled the Babylonians. And we asked for, for just basic food and, and, and food and water, just to survive. And they gave us salty, salty food, famished Jews. And then they gave us these flasks to drink from. And the flasks were filled with air. And what happened, the pockets of air caused, caused rupture and, and killed the Jews as they sucked the air into the system. What's reach lo arav? 
We know the whole idea of reach nichoach, that when you come before God, you offer a korban, whether the korban is a prayer, whether the korban is a mincha, whether the korban is, is an animal, an ola. It has to be reach nichoach. Our, our avoda was not reach nichoach. It was corrupt. It was perverted. It was not pleasant before God. Because why? The lane that we had this morning. When you seek out God, it has to be with all your heart and with your very being. It has to be sincere. It can't be hypocritical. It can't be duplicitous. And it says here, the Kinnah, the Kalir tells us, we, we, we were filthy, we were stained with filth. What is that referring to? Instead of us being a role model to the nations, instead of us looking at us and saying, wow, that's how a person should act. That's how you're supposed to treat your employee. That's what an employee, how they should treat their employer. That's how you treat a family, a wife, a child, a, f a husband, a father, a mother. Just the opposite. Unfortunately, we, were, we corrupted ourselves. We acted in a perverse way. We have this challenge today. How often do they talk about us in the newspapers? Financial corruption, scandal after scandal. Instead of being the people of Chosh and Mishpat, we're the people of the dre. You know, why do things glot when you can do it glot yosher, as Breuer would say, and straight, when you can macha dre? You macha dre, and what happens? Yamakas, suits, beards, in the paper for what? Not for Kiddush Hashem, not for chesed, but in the newspaper for financial corruption. We stink. We're stained. There's a filth to us. And this is what the Kalir talks about. This is, of course, based upon the paragimel of Eicha last night, when Yirmiyahu says, Sosam tfilasi. My prayer, my tefillah, it's been closed off. We didn't say tiskabel. God, you should accept Sloson of Uson. Our praises, our petitions before you. There is no Kabbalah's tefillah on, on Tisha B'Av. We can't say Nachem in the morning. Because sasam mi meni tfilasi, sasam tchina, velo nasan li rachem in vechanina. There is no tachem, there is no rachem in vechanina. Umikir as chana na kvar yochana. Shamu kitzi atzasi bashivya, venisra vadas marom shvuya, vushati lishama verbuvya. What the Jewish people are in a state of desolation, confusion. Instead of us being the people of chachma and wisdom, we're in a state of desolation and confusion. Ume haster chavuya galsa beis chavuya. Tavora samuni hadamin vishasu sha'arai shomemin veheshi vachoryamin. God turned away va'avon slamim because of the different gods and idols that we set up. Noa ginson salmin. Tavo samriach vechashki tazriach. The kadesh atzmosinu tafriach. Hashem, turn our darkness into light. Vereach nichochenu kedem tariach. Once again, accept our prayers, accept our tshuva, accept our korbanos. Umishuchancha. Let us be guests at your table. Instead of the Shulchan Gavoa, where the Kohanim partook of, the Shulchan Gavoa is the Mizbeach. Now what? We've been cast off. There is no longer a Mizbeach. We ask God that once again we should come to Yerushalayim, to Beis Amikdash, to participate in his home, to be his guest, to be at a place of learning and growth. Shule Hamas Ariach. We'll turn to Kina Yud Aleph now. There's a medrash the Rav would quote where Rabbi Akiva, when he went to Ginzak to raise money, you know, his rabbis would go to raise funds for the institutions in Israel. And he gave a drush and he spoke about the Dor Hamabul, the destruction of, of what happened. And no one was moved. They were actually sat there fairly stone-faced. Then he started to talk about Eov and he started to darshan the story of what happened to one man burying his own children, to the suffering that he went through the destruction of everything that he had created and accomplished, how Eov was a broken man. And the people cried, and the people were moved. What's the point, if I could use an analogy? We can't fathom what six million are. We have no clue. We just can't relate to it. But the story of Anne Frank, after the Bible, is the second most popular book in the history of humanity. More copies of the diary of Anne Frank. Why? Because the story of a little girl and her family, that people can relate to. We all know that in the 1980s, 
when they took polls in America, how many Americans believed that there were six million people who did, killed in the Holocaust? And the numbers were terrible. They were like in the 50s, low 60s. Two years later, they did the exact same poll, the exact same question. You know what happened two years later? It was after Schindler's List came out. Steven Spielberg did a masterful job. There were many, many screenplays of that in terms of the text, and he waited for what he thought would work. And with that, with that Schindler's List, they took the exact same poll, and 90-some percent of Americans felt that six million people died. It was a movie. It was something that was created by a, a director. But you know what? People could relate to the Holocaust through the life of one man. Remember Stern, the man Ben Kingsley played? Through the story of a few people, then they could relate to the Holocaust. And that happens in the Kinos as well. Many of the Kinos we're going to be learning today are the story of the macro destruction. But many of them we're going to be learning, particularly this first one about Yoshiao HaMelech and about the son and daughter of Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol, the 23rd Kina, and Arze Halavanon, the, the 10 martyrs. When we tell their individual stories, that's when it hits home. Because psychologically and emotionally, that's something we can relate to, we can fathom. Who was Yoshiao HaMelech? We're going to study him. He came after 62 years of corruption. His great-great-grandfather, I apologize, his great-grandfather, Chizkiyahu, was one of the great Jewish kings, one of the great educators. But Chizkiyahu didn't have children until later in life, as you know. And his son, Menashe, was the longest reigning Jewish king, 55 years. The first 33 years of those 55 were absolute corruption. He himself does tshuva later in life, but he's incapable of changing the people. So the 55 years of Menashe are a downhill slope. His son, Amon, who's the father of Yoshiao, becomes king for seven years. He himself never does tshuva. So you realize Yoshiao is coming after 62 years of corruption. 62 years of a dysfunctional leadership that allowed for a vodazara, that allowed for all types of corruption. If I could use an analogy, think of the impact that 70 years of communism had on the Jews under the former Soviet Union. You know, a Jew will come here from North Africa, a Jew will come here from Iran, a Jew will come here from anywhere else, and if they're exposed to Yiddishkeit, you see, they take to it like a fish to water. It has an effect, a traumatic a cathartic effect on their family. That wasn't true of the Russian immigration. Not the Russian immigration here in the 70s, nor the Russian immigration in the 70s or 80s, those who made it to Israel. Why? Because of the terrible, toxic, pathologic effect of seven decades of communism. And that's essentially what Yoshiao Amelech was walking into. Over six decades of corruption and perversion. What happens? It's a young man, and we're going to hear his story. He could have turned it around. He could have saved the Jewish people. His death, his tragic death, was ultimately the beginning of the end. You've all heard the phrase, the person has died, we haven't had the funeral yet. With Yoshiahu HaMelech's death, 22 years before the Churban, Churban Bayez Rishon, that was the end. No, the Churban wouldn't take place for another 22 years, and we'll see why. But that was the end of the Jewish people. It's the life of one person, the impact of one person, what one Jew can be, what Jew, one Jew can become. And as you know, the fourth parak of Eicha that we read last night, Eicha, I apologize, the Eicha Yom Zav, that fourth parak is the eulogy, is the hesped that Yirmiyahu Hanavi gave at the funeral of Yoshiao Melech. But let's read the kina inside. It was Yirmiyah, the Gadol Hador, Yirmiyahu, who said the kin over Yoshiahu. Echa Eli, he's Echa, again the question. We're going to explain the term Echa when we get to Kina Yud Gimel. He was eight years old, a young boy when he became the king. Obviously, there are probably regents who oversaw things, but he became the official king. As a young boy, he was stirred to do tshuva. Lidrosh me'alav of his own. B'nei Khan, the Egyptians, Ba'avram Khanu alav. We'll see it was the Egyptian army that executed, that, that killed him in the battle of Megiddo. We'll get to that later. V'lo huzkar lo sigoi mifalav. And unfortunately, his death, his great deeds were not, not enough to save him. 
Gam bechalam lachim asher kamu ligdor, lo kam kamohu mimosa ligdor. This was the greatest Jewish leader in Jewish history from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. So all the Mephorshim ask on the Kalir, how can you say that he was the greatest from the time of Igdor? You know, Avigdor was the name of Moshe. We call him Moshe because that's the name that Basparo, that Batya gave him. And his Hakaras Atov is an eternal gratitude that the Jewish people have to, to Batya, following the Rabboni Sha'olam's lead, we call him Moshe. But his mother did not name him Moshe. Moshe's name was Avigdor. There was never as great a leader for the Jewish people from the, from, from the time of Avigdor. What do you mean? There was Joshua, there was Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, King David, King Solomon, King Chizkiyahu, Hezekiah the Melech. What, what do you mean? So the answer that the Mephorshim give is this. What the Kalir is saying is, look, David and Shlomo took over a great nation. They may have had warts and pimples and mistakes and certain unique flaws, but as a whole, it was an educated nation. They were good people. They were observant people. They were moral, ethical people. What he inherited, no one inherited a mess like this. Ovdei Avodah Zarah. Think about Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was taking a group of illiterate pagan slaves, and he had to transform and turn, the, turn them into what? Transform them into the, the people of knowledge, the people of wisdom, into an ethical people, into a, a, a philosophical, theological people. That is a challenge that Yoshiao had. There was no leader who was able, we'd say the turnaround king, that could turn around a nation. Not since the time of Moshe, no one did that the way he did. Davak bo avon leitzane hador. But what was his flaw? It wasn't his flaw, but he's held responsible as the leader. The cynics, right? With every leadership, no matter who the rabbi is, no matter who the Rosh Yeshiva is, you're always going to have the cynics that they love to knock. God forbid they should do anything themselves. God forbid they should be responsible for the people. But no, they sit with their sarcastic, cynical remarks. That's the leitzane hador. Asher achar hadelis kamalistor. They did this behind closed doors. See, what, what he did, Yoshia, is he removed all the idols. All the pagan worship was eradicated in public. He stopped the private altars, which could lead to paganism. But you know what? You don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Right? We don't know which of our neighbors are beating their spouse. Right? Unless you hear the cries and the screams, you don't know what happens behind closed doors. There were people who publicly were very, very monotheistic. They were very Jewish. Behind closed doors, they had their getchkas, they had their idols. By the way, we, it's tragic, but that was the case. And likewise, how do you know what someone's doing? You smell, you think it's a barbecue, right? How do you know they didn't bring their own private kohen in? They're not having their own personal sacrifice instead of going to the base of Mikdush? You don't know. Ochlim zerashich, or those who eat the black, referring to the, the, the people of Egypt. Kismu hatov pichamu mishur. His beautiful you know, uh, radiance, it was what? It was blackened, it was darkened. Vayigdal avon veheshev yamin achor. Vaod lo shalach yado min achor. Zaku amarav kenam das lahakim bitza emraso be'aror asher lo yakim. What happened? As a function of the corruption of his father and his grandfather, and keep in mind, this is before the printing press. What did people learn from in antiquities? They learned from a, safer, from a cloth, right? From, they, they would take out the Navi or the Sefer Torah. That's what they learned from. That was their text. What happens? One Sefer Torah was found in the base of Mikdash that they hadn't eradicated, that somehow it had escaped the, the previous government of his father and his grandfather. And guess what? He opened it up. It opened up the Parshas Kisavo. You're familiar with the, the, cur the klolos and brachos, right? the curses and the blessings in Parshish Kisavo. And what does he read there? The last of the klolos is, I apologize, I don't know the exact text. Asher lo yakim is called divrei torozos. The Ramban explains that, that klolo. What does it mean, lo yakim? It's the hefil, the causative verb. Will not, cause to, will not allow to be established. What's it referring to? It's referring to the melech. Melech b'mishpat yamid aretz. The role of the Jewish king, the Jewish executive king is a bad translation, the leader, the, the executive, is to do what? To make sure that society runs ethically and morally, to make sure that society runs theologically, the bein adam l'makam, the bein adam l'chavero, that everything's observed properly. And he realized the great weight and the great responsibility upon the melech Yisrael, being the leader of the Jewish people, is not about kavod, being the leader of the Jewish people is about responsibility, to make sure you have a Torah society. And it traumatized him. And he committed himself to, to that lifestyle. 
When those from far, the Egyptian armies came, came from Africa, it became darkened. We'll talk about that. What happened? As you know in history, the Jewish people have always been in the middle of the two great powers. In the last century, we were caught between the Western world and the Eastern bloc, between communism and democracy. The battleground was Israel. Where would the Russians use their implements and test them out? They gave the Egyptians, they gave the Syrians their implements, it would be used against Israel. In antiquities, there was always a great southern empire, Mitzrayim, right? Mitzrayim is not Egypt. Mitzrayim was, took up close to a third of the African continent. It's a huge empire, that's a great southern empire. And there was always a great northern empire. It changed throughout the, the biblical period. Aram, which we'd call Syria, part of Turkey, then Ashur, Assyria, which is Turkey, Syria, eastern part of Syria, eventually Bavel, Babylonia, which is today Iraq. So the Egyptian forces asked to go through Israel because how do you get from Egypt, from Africa, how do you get to Mesopotamia? How do you get to Turkey? You have to go through Israel. And they wanted to take the Via Maris to go through Israel. What do I mean by the Via Maris? You go up, you go up the coast, and then there are a couple places you can cross over. Probably the most famous cross where you can cross through the mountains to get through is called the Megiddo Junction. By the way, we, if you've go, you have to go to Megiddo when you're in Israel. You see the stables. You, you get an image of what Shlomo HaMelech had at Megiddo, of what King Ahav had at Megiddo. And you cross through it. So you cross through the Galilee. There's like an area where you can cross through the Galil and you can make your way into Mesopotamia. By the way, part of that crossing Okay, is what we call derech avos. That's how Avraham came when, when he was told lech lecha. That's how Yaakov came when he came back from Lavan, that, that natural crossing. Today in Israel, they call it Highway 60, not, not the Megiddo Junction. Megiddo, Megiddo Junction is, is the west coast of Israel. I'm talking about one of the crossings is through the center of the country. So what happens? That's the story of lech lecha, it's Highway 60. The story of Yaakov Avinu coming back, that's Highway 60, where, where literally the turn takes place at Shechem and you move south. But what Yoshiahu felt is how in the world can he allow the Egyptian forces to pass through Israel, even though they're not going to touch the Jews. They're not at war against the Jews. They're going to fight who? Aram. They're going to fight the great northern kingdom. But first of all, it's a statement that we're taking sides. We're taking sides with Egypt. And secondly, Yoshiahu was young. And you know what happens when you're young? You're optimistic. To a certain degree, you're naive. He assumed, because he eradicated the Avodah Zarah, that the famous bracha from Parshas Bichil Kosai, it says, Cherev lo sa'avor ba'artzachem. The sword will not pass through your land. He assumed that was going to take place, that, that he was worthy of that. Not only would there not be war, there would be shalom, but even afilu cherev shel shalom. What's, what's cherev shel shalom? I'll give you an example. If the Canadian army crossed the tunnel or at Windsor and came through Detroit and went on to Highway 75 and went down Highway 75 on its way to Mexico to fight the Mexicans, even though they're not fighting America, we'd be very, very nervous. We'd be very uneasy. You know, those huge diesel engines having thousands of troops traveling through our land. Well, Yoshiao felt that we don't need to have thousands of Egyptian troops traveling through our land on their way to Aram, to Syria. And he comes out and he says, don't do that. Don't come forward. We're not allowing you to pass through our land. And Yirmiyahu, the prophet, begs him. He says, Yoshiao, we're not worthy. You don't understand. What you see is one-dimensional. You don't see what goes on behind closed doors. We're not on that level. We're not Zohar. To, to be at the level of cherev lo savor ba'artzachem, afilu cherev shel shalom. But he didn't listen to the prophet. He didn't listen to Jeremiah, to your miyahu anavi. And he comes out with, with thousands of troops to try to stop the Egyptians as they're about to go off the coast, taking the Via Maris through the Megiddo Junction. And Paro Necho, who's a very, you know, we know this today from many, many... Um, the, the leader of Turkey is this way. Arafat was this way. We know many of the Arab leaders are this way. They're very manipulative. They're good with the spoken word. And they turn things, they, with their lives, they turn things upside down. 
That's exactly what Paro Necho, the leader of Egypt, did. Paro Necho said, Ma leave Allah, you're starting up with me. I have no problems with you, the Jews. Don't you start with me. If you start, what do you mean we're starting with him? He's bringing thousands of soldiers into our land. We're starting with him? Yes, we're starting with him. He says, I'm going to go to war with you if you start with me. I'm telling you now. I'm asking you nicely. Don't start with me. And Yirmiyahu pleads with Yoshiahu, don't fight this battle. Yoshiahu doesn't listen. And we'll see what happens in a minute. Ki lahamonai. The masses we were, were wiped out. Laleches aram naharayim. As the Egyptians were going to Mesopotamia, to Syria. Liman lo savor cherev kol shehu befrayim. It took place, of course, in the area of Shevet Ephraim. Lo shama lechoze. He didn't listen to the prophet, Lashuva Kharayim, to back off and to refrain from this battle. Kigzeira Nigzara Lasakh Mitzrayim de Mitzrayim. Mechatos Stiras Mezuzos, what caused him to lose this battle, this great righteous king, this great Balchuva who was responsible for thousands of Balai Chuva? It was the sin of what took place behind the Mezuzos, what took place behind the doorpost. Chazon Ansosi, the vision of Yirmiyahu from Anatot. Anatot was a suburb of Jerusalem, the northern suburb that Yirmiyahu was from. Hechei lulavazos. They, they, they mocked it. They, de, they defiled the, the, the Nevua and they, they, made, they abused him for, for, for talking the way he was. They called him a pacifist. Na'o anamim l'chumo l'havzos. V'lo heisev panav v'sof drozos. In Nebuch, instead of what? Instead of celebrating Yoshiahu instead of we're going to see, instead of coming together, that fall, that, it took place in the summer, this war. That fall, the whole Jewish world was going to come together to Yerushalayim. You know why? It was the year of Hakel. Every Jew is supposed to do Elias Haregel for Sukkot. But once every seven years after the completion of the Shemitah cycle, the beginning of the first year of the next Shemitah cycle, there's Hakel. They reenact what happened at Har Sinai. They reenact the giving of the Torah. Who's the one that reads the Torah, Sefer Devarim? It's the Melech. And instead of the whole Jewish world coming together to learn Torah from, from Yoshiao HaMelech, from this righteous king, this great Baal Tshuva, this leader of the greatest Baal Tshuva movement, instead the whole Jewish world came together. Not for Hakel. They came together what? Nebuch for his funeral. Because he was killed along with hundreds of soldiers who were killed by the Egyptian army at Megiddo. Suru heidu adlo shi'iya v'yamanu sur matzi yasod neshiya p'nei karav karav, right? The battle took place v'lo alsa lo shi'iya. He wasn't successful. V'yoru ha'yorim l'melech yoshiahu. What happened was, we're going to see in a second, they took, when they originally wounded him, they took his body and they put it up against the wall and they used it as a bullseye. And they told the Egyptian archers to attack him with arrows. Odenu otsim enav begevio no chatsim. Before his eyes are closing, chetz achar chetz, arrow after arrow, morim velo chatsim. They, they fire into his body. Tzadu v'samuhu kematara lachitsim. They used him as a bullseye, for, as target practice for the Egyptian soldiers. Vayizriku bo shlosh meos chitsim, 300 arrows in his body. Kalim tzatzasu acharav ezon motzafihu, vad mitzoi nefesh masav hefihu. What happened? As he's laying there dying with hundreds of arrows, tens of arrows in his body, what happens? His last breath, ruach sefasav hitza mipihu. The last breath that he can say. What is? What are the last words out of his mouth? Tzadik hu adonoi ki marisi fihu. Tzidu kadin. He acknowledges. I died. I was killed. All, all these innocent soldiers were killed because I rebelled against the word of God, because I didn't listen to the Navi. Tzadik hu Adonoi ki marisi fihu. Sisi nof, nof is, of, is Memphis, go rejoice ki kano za'am, the city in Memphis, not Tennessee, but in Egypt. L'shalem sha'onam ba'avon bitzam, tam kesem atov. This beautiful, the, the radiance of this great young leader. It's over. Amzu b'fasham v'yekonein alav kol eicha yuamzav. In the, the fourth parak of eicha, eicha yuamzav is the kina that Yirmiyahu says. Tam b'mikra echad kos megido lishtos. B'moed shnas hashmita kigah hakel esos. Again, instead of them coming together to hear him teaching Torah that fall in the base of Mikdash, they came together to hear Yirmiyahu. Tala 
Esrim Ushtayim Meharosh Hasos, Ki Saftu Lo Echa Be'esrim Ushtayim Osos. What happened? Yirmiyahu, the kina was a 22-line kina. Why did Yirmiyahu do 22 lines? Aleph to Tuf. As you know, Echa is Aleph to Tuf. What was the idea? Yirmiyahu is saying is there's no way that we can articulate. There's no way we can describe the, the, the magnanimity, the depth of the loss of losing Yoshiahu. And it says because the people felt bad. All those cynics that we spoke about, the late Sane Hador, the people who were Achar Hadeles, Bestiris Hamazuzos that we talked about earlier, these very same people, they cried, they were sad. You know what they say, Achar Emos Kedosh Emor. After the person's dead, then they call him the Kadosh. While he was alive, they ate his Kishkazat. That's what happened to Yoshiahu. The people finally realized what they had. And because the, the tremendous remorse and sadness, and there was a real stirring of tshuva, it was a delay of 22 years before what? To quote the phrase, Tala Esri Mushtaim, a delay of 22 years, Meharos Shasos, before the destruction of the temple. We're now going to go, because we're a little bit behind time, we're going to skip to Yud Gimel. We're going to skip uh, Yud Bez. We may come back to it, but let's go to Yud Gimel, Eko. One thing we have to understand, we have to understand what does the meaning, what is the meaning of Eicha? What does the word Eicha mean? So in Pshat, there are two possibilities, and in Drash, there are two others. We're going to have four, we're going to describe four meanings. According to the Ravs itself, the word Eicha here that Yirmiyahu uses, that is the basis of all kinos, it's the beginning of the kinos, both in the morning, the evening and the morning, Eicha means why. We are questioning God. We're questioning the Almighty. Why, God? Why did you allow this to happen? Every other day of the year, if you use the Hebrew calendar, 353 days. If you use the solar calendar, 364 days of the year, a Jew has no right to question, has no right to challenge God. How can you answer why? To quote Eov, we don't know the basis. The very beginnings of the physical universe were barely starting to scrape to understand the surface of the physical universe. We don't understand physics. We're going to know metaphysics. We're going to become the masters of God's accounting system. It's ludicrous for a limited, a finite, a frail intellect to sit and question God. It's ludicrous because we don't have, the, we don't have a clue of the facts. We don't have a clue of the system. One day a year, there's a license to, chest, to question. One day a year we can question the Almighty. How did you allow a million and a half innocent children to die, to be slaughtered? What sin did a million and a half children do? One day a year we can sit and say, an innocent young bride who's pregnant with her first child, the Tartars and the Cossacks, they come, they rape her, then they cut open, and I'm quoting now Yevain Metsula. If you want to get it in English, abyss of despair. It's the eyewitness accounts of the survivors of Tachvatat, of the Chimelnitzi massacres that took place in 1648 through 1653. As they will go along the Dnieper River, throughout the Ukraine, throughout Galicia, into Poland, into Lita. And they cut open her, her womb. They rip out the fetus and they take a cat, live cats, and they sew up a live cat in her womb. And they watch her as, she, as the cat is screeching and killing her to death. And they watch her bleed to death. And they sit there and they mock this. What did the Jew do to deserve that? In our wildest imagination, we couldn't imagine a death like that. And we say, why, God? That's Eicha. Why did you allow this to happen? They're better than us. You want? We were corrupt. We were perverted. We didn't do what we were supposed to as a people, as a nation. You want them instead? You want the Hamas? They take an innocent mother who's driving with her children, and after they run her off the road and they see that they're not all dead, at gunpoint they go and they, they take their guns and they use them and they, they, they butcher a family. You want the Hamas instead? That's, that's morality? That's ethics? These animals? One day a year we have the right to question. Why? That's Eicha. The Rav has a, had many great students, but one of the great students is Rabbi Yisrael Chait. He has a yeshiva that many of you are familiar with, Yeshiva B'nai Torah. Rav Chait is unique because he's one of the few people that was a Talmud first of Rav Aaron Cutler, 
And then in his later years, he learned at MTJ, he would go Friday to the Ashir, the, the today we call the Shir, the Dibras Moshe. And during the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the Rav gave Shir. So he would Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday attend the Rav Shirim and Rav Moshe Shir, the Dibras Moshe Shir on Friday. Many people attended Shurim of Rav Aaron Cutler, of Rav Moshe, of the Rav. Not too many understood it. He may have been the one unique person that we have till this day. He's in his 70s. He's a Rosh Hashiva, he's a Shiva in Farakaway. So it's a Talmud of the Rav and Rav Moshe. And he, he you know, respectfully begged to differ with the Rav. He says, a Jew never has the right to question God. Not even on Tisha B'av. Not even on Tisha B'av. What is Eicha? Eicha is not meant to be translated as why. It's a rhetorical question. How could it be? How could it be? We can't fathom. It's impossible for us to fathom how Eicha, right, the Ir Rabasiam, Eicha Yashavadad Ir Rabasiam. How could such a, and Josephus described the, the excitement, the energy in the air, and now it's desolate. It's desolate. The foxes run in the Makom HaKadosh HaKadoshim. We can't imagine that. We can't fathom that. How could it be? See, the Rav said that the typical response to tragedy is Vayidom Aaron. It's Vayidom Aaron. Aaron was silent. On what should have been the greatest day of his life, his two boys, his two sons, Nadav and Avi, who died. And he sits in silence and he accepts it. Because how does a human being know how God works, what God allows to happen, what God does not allow to happen? How can a human being claim to understand that? Moshe Rabbeinu, the Gemara in Menachos, when he asked to the Rebbeinu Shalom, Zu Torah, Zu Schara, this is a Torah, this is its reward? I don't understand. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't understand that. The most intellectually perfected human being in the history of humanity, that was a body of knowledge that even transcended and surpassed the intellect of Moshe Rabbeinu. And our response is that Yidamara. And Rabbi Chait felt, Rabbi Chait felt that on Tisha B'av as well, we do not have the right to question God, even on Tisha B'av. And what is Eicha then? It's not why. Eicha is how could it be? How could this? It's a question. How is this possible? That's in shot. Either why or how could this be a rhetorical question? How is this possible? In Drash, Eicha, and this is not the Pshuto Shamikra, but Eicha has two other meanings. Eiko. We're going to learn now the 13th kina. What is a ko? Where is the ko? What does ko mean? Ko is a term that is specifically ambiguous. Ko does not mean po, which means here. Ko does not mean sham, which means there. It could mean po or sham. Ko is a term of Jewish destiny. It's this nebulous, ambiguous term that is used when we talk about the unique, singular destiny of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people. That's the term that the Almighty uses. That's the term that Avram Avinu uses. That's the term that the Navi, the Navi and the prophets use. Ko Amar Hashem. It's a term of Jewish destiny. And we'll see that in a second. In the second drash, the fourth of the four ways of explaining the word Eicha, is by using different nekudos, Ayeka. What is Ayeka? From what the Almighty said to Adam, where are you? Where are you was really, uh, when I say where are you, meaning who are you? Where are you at? Who are you? It's a rhetorical question. We start out questioning God, but in the end we look ourselves in the mirror and we question ourselves. Ayeka. Where are we? Who are we as a Jewish people that we haven't lived up to our covenant? We haven't lived up to our responsibilities as fathers, as mothers, as employees, as leaders, as friends is a mamleches kohanim, a yeka. At this point in Kina Yud Gimel, we're going to use eko. Eko omer koras la'av befetzach bebris ben absarim ko yelanetzach. We ask God, what happened to the ko yezaracha that you said to Avram Avinu that there would be an eternal historical covenant between the Almighty and the Jewish people? Ve'inata, now look at it. Bul atzamayel beretzach. We're consumed, our bones are ripped apart, are murdered and, and wrenched from us. Lama Elohim Zanachta Lanetzach. Why Lanetzach is like for eternity, it seems for eternity that you have rejected us. Eiko gash kese laola laratzosecha. Nelcha adko pito beedosecha. The famous line, 
What does Avraham say? He, there's four people that are traveling from the home in Hebron up through the Judean hills towards Jerusalem. There's Eliezer, Avraham's trusted loyal servant. His oldest son, Ishmael, Yishmael. Yitzchak and Avraham, the four of them. And Avraham turns to Yishmael and Eliezer. The Medrash spells it out. Because Avram asked, do you see anything? He saw that there was a cloud like the Ananea Kavod over a mountain. That mountain, of course, is the Temple Mount, is Har HaMoria. Yitzchak saw it, and the other two said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. What happens? Avram turns to Eliezer and Yishmael, and they're good people. Yishmael's done tshuva at this point. He's a good person. He says, Vatem teshvu poi machamor. You, the two of you, reside here. You stay here with the donkey. Va'ani v'hanar nelcha adko v'nishtachava v'nashuva lechem. I and Na'ar, whether Yitzchak was 37, whether he, was a, he really was a youth, a young man, we're going to go adko, adko. We're going to worship God and we'll return. What's ko? You know what ko is? The Jewish religion is the only major religion that believes you don't have to be Jewish to be perfected. There's a whole institution called Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the religion that's given to humanity. Abraham and Sarah, our progenitors, were B'nai Noach. Yitzchak and Rivka were B'nai Noach. Moshe was a Ben Noach before the conversion at Har Sinai. But the Jewish people take upon ourselves, we entered a covenant, and we took upon ourselves perfected monotheism. Not just seven macro categories, but we took the system of 613 categories, the Taryag Mitzvos. That notion of that commitment to the Almighty, that commitment ethically, morally, that commitment theologically, philosophically, of a perfected lifestyle, a group of people that commits ourselves to that special, unique destiny, that's Nelcha Adko. You stay with the Chamor, the Bale Drush, say, what's Chamor? It's from the word Chomer. You stay. In the physical world, you're leading good, wonderful lives. But we are going to transcend that. So that commitment that we've made following in the footsteps of Avram and Yitzchak, the ultimate sacrifice, where they would sacrifice themselves, the most precious thing they have for a godly lifestyle, the Akedah. Your flock, whether Raya Secha is your friends, your beloved ones, or your flock. What's happened? We're slaughtered like a pomegranate. You know when they take those, those samurai knives and they slaughter it and they cut us apart? Yeshan abcha betzon marisecha. Eiko atachas akudim nekudim b'masha'os. The dreams that Yaakov Avinu had, that special providential protection from the Ribbono Sha'olam, that he was being swindled and manipulated. Lavan changed his wages a hundred different times in a six-year period. That's after lying to him about his own wife, cheating him on his own daughter. What does it say? es maskorti aseris monim. You switched my wages a hundred different times in the period of the last six years. Yaakov never gave up his integrity, never gave up his honesty, but the Almighty looked after him. There was a special providential protection that no matter how Yaakov would change the deal. Every couple of weeks, he would change the deal. What happened? When there would be a new condition, God, through the dream, would give him a new condition. He looked after him. Where is that co? Where is that providential protection for the Jewish people? Moshe Rabbeinu, the prince of Egypt, potentially the next pharaoh. And he gives it all up. Here he was doing all kinds of wonderful things to make the Jewish life easier, to make it safer for the Jews so they could survive in Egypt. You know the Medrash, it says, he argued with the pharaoh. Hey, give him a day off. You know why? You'll get more production. If you give them one day off so they can rejuvenate their batteries, they'll be much more productive the other six days a week. And guess what happened? Moshe instituted the ability that they could observe the Sabbath, the Shabbos, and Mitzrayim. He was doing things that would have helped the Jews. When he would have become the Pharaoh, he would have freed the Jews. He gave it all up. You know why? Because Nebuch, 
this one innocent Jew is being beaten to death by an Egyptian taskmaster. So what does he do? Vayifen kova ko. It doesn't say he looked here and there. It doesn't say vayifen kova sham. It says vayifen kova ko. He looked in the Medrash says, would anything come out of this Egyptian? Would a righteous descendant come out of this Egyptian? What Nebuch will happen to this innocent Jew if he's killed? He looked at the future generations of innocents that are being killed. What a Clinice would say, when you kill a man, you kill everything he's ever been and everything he ever will be. What did, what did a Kodesh Baruch Hu say to, to Cain? What was calling out? Kol demei achicha tzolakim elai. What's demei the bloods? It should say dam achicha. Dam zaro, his blood, his descendants' blood, his great descendants' blood. From one human being, you created a, a world, a universe, and all of that is going to be slaughtered and destroyed. That's Vayif and Kovako. And you know what else Vayif and Kovako was? He gave up his future. He gave up being the leader of the free world, not the free world, of the whole world. Egypt control that was the dominant empire of the civilized world. He gave it all up to save an innocent. That sensitivity to life, that sensitivity to one human being, that sensitivity, God, where is all of that? It's throughout the millennia we've been slaughtered and butchered, 100,000 in the 17th century, thousands under the Spanish and Portuguese in the 15th century, 6 million in the 20th century, Hundreds, we've, we're over a thousand korbanos since, I hate to use the word intifada. Intifada is an Arab word, Arabic word that means sh wiping off the schmutz, the filth. That's what they refer to us as. It's not an intifada, it's the Oslo War. It was a terrorist war against us. It never stops. Look at our sensitivity to human life. Hashem Almighty, where's the sensitivity? A ko, where is that ko? I'm sorry, that was the one that we had. I apologize. According to Rashi, the Geula, where Hashem sent Moshe, it was specifically exactly after 400 years. The Brisbane Absarim was made when? 30 years before the birth of Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac is born from the day of his birth. Kiger your descendants will not control the land that they're in. For 400 years till the day, it was the 15th of Nisan. That is when the Jewish people, so there was a time sensitivity on behalf of the Almighty. A time sensitivity for Geula. 70 years, the Nevuah of Yirmiyahu and Navi, that the Chorban would be for 70 years. 70 years later, we rebuilt the Beis HaMikdash under Darius when the Jews came back in the time of Zerubbabel and Ezra. Do you know how long it's been? Almost two millennia. Almost two millennia since the, the Roman destruction. This, the Roman exile that we're still in, that the wandering Jew, the wandering Hebrew from country to country, from place to place, scattered amongst the four corners of the earth. It's a two-millennia diaspora. Where is that time sensitivity? Where is that co of Jewish destiny? Those treacherous ones, your enemies, they sit beveis v'udecha. Who sits in the place of the Kodesh Kadoshim? You know who? Today, it's not Titus anymore. It was Titus. Today it's the Muslim, the Imams. You ever listen to the, you ever read the translations of the drushos they give on Friday in the mosque? How they try to rally the troops to throw stones. We're davening at the Kotel. They should hit us. You know, you know what a stone coming from that height will do? It'll kill anybody. You can, you can be a weightlifter. A stone with that kind of, the laws of physics with that kind of gravity will kill you. And they're always trying to charge. That's coming out of the Kodesh Kadoshim the place of peace, the place of, 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 of theological knowledge, the place of, of the, the basis of all ethics and morals. That's what's coming out of base view decha. Shagut zorerecha. They, they roar like a lion. Bekerev moadecha. And that's exactly what we're going through as we speak. The roaring, the yelling, the screaming. Al-Akhbar that goes on is the shagut zorerecha. 
a kog krisis chadashas brisas kolamar chachatzos halayla, that real refined sensitivity to time, immediately, exactly at midnight, exactly at midnight will be the time of the geula, the moseosos, and that's when it was, when the Jewish people went free, that auspicious, that famous Pesach night that we call Pesach Mitzrayim. You know, when we come to the base of Mikdash, there has to be a sensitivity. You don't wear shoes. You know, you know what shoes are. That's why we're not wearing leather shoes today. According to the Rambam, you can't wear any shoe that, that gives support to the feet. You know why? Because what happens when you walk without support on your feet? You're sensitive to the environment. There's a total sensitivity that you have to the environment. And we don't and these animals that came, think about the Nazi stormtroopers. What's always the image you have, not just of the Wehrmacht, but of the SS when they came? Those boots, the Nazi boots, no sensitivity. How they stepped over our dying in the street. You see the images from the Warsaw Ghetto. They stepped all over us. The Roman legions coming in with their pounding and pounding with their shoes in the Mikdash. That was a place where you wouldn't wear shoes like that. It's a place of sensitivity. Eko mishma Moshe Allah kosa marlin vas bayis meulas veinata niatsu bnei avla yivada kemevi lamala. What's the ko here? Kosomar lebeis Yaakov v'sagei livnei Yisrael. So the Rav said, what does it mean kosomar lebeis Yaakov? So first of all, Judaism is religion. The teachings, there's a sensitivity. There's such a, a sensitivity in the teachings of what. To the women, you say it one way because they will perceive it and they will appreciate it. They'll internalize it one way. To the men, it's not tomar, it's tagade. Kasha kigidin, Rashi says. It's a different way of articulation so that they'll understand it. And say it specifically this way. Don't fudge it. Don't be too verbose. There's a certain sensitivity and perfection in the communication so that the learner, that the student can appreciate, can understand it. Where God is a sensitivity to that message? Where is this ko somar lebeis Yaakov, the sagid livnei Yisrael? Where is that ko? Vein ata niatsu b'nei avla yivada kemevi lamala. Eko siach shishim osios hakadumos. What are the 60 letters? It's referring to the birkas kohanim. What are the kohanim supposed to say? Ko sevarachu es b'nei Yisrael. Ko. This is the way that you should communicate my providential knowledge to the Jewish people. What, are, what is Birkas Kohanim? You know what it is? It's the three aspects of providence that enable the Jewish people to survive. Yivarecha Hashem v'yishmarecha. God should give you financial sustenance. If a Jew can't support himself, if you're a taker, whether you're living off your parents, your in-laws, whether you're living off the government, whether you're living off of charity, psychologically, it's a terrible life. You're needy. A Jew should never have to be a taker. Lowly day matnas basav adam. And not only should we be able to survive financially, the yishmarecha. We all know people in this last financial crisis People here I know from Brentwood, they had, they're wealthy people. When they got married 30-some years ago, it was a merger of two wealthy families. Now they're in their 70s. And you know what? They saw over the years that there was one hedge fund that was outperforming everything else. It was a hedge fund run by Bernie Madoff. And they took all their assets out of all their other places, and they put it. And Bernie Madoff consistently, every month they got return on their money, return on their money. These people never flew coach. These people had enough that their children and their grandchildren wouldn't have to work. Guess what? They woke up one morning without a cent. The only thing they had to their name was their house. But the cost of maintaining that house in Brentwood is so significant, they have to give up their own home. You know what it's like when you're in your 70s and you lived a certain way your whole life? You've lived the life of wealth the last seven decades? Not only Yivarecha Hashem, but Yishmarecha. There should be a Shmira to our wealth. We shouldn't lose it. The whole institution of the Torah, of De Machsaro, charity is according to one's means. If someone was always a pauper, you provide basic sustenance. If someone led a certain life for their own self worth, for their own self dignity, 
can't live the life of just bread and water in basic clothing. Psychologically, they have no self-worth, self-dignity that way. Second, Ya'er Adoshem Panavi Lecha Vichonek. What's Ya'er? Or Torah. After we live, we can survive. We have to have the, the basic, basic sustenance of our existence is the Torah, is the teachings, the values, the principles, the axioms of our Mesorah, that we should live a life that we're always engaged, enlightened, that we're always thinking, that we're growing, we're understanding, we're questioning, we're developing, that it's a deeper and deeper relationship with the universe we live in, with our God, with our people, with humanity. And then finally, Yisa Hashem Panavei Lecha V'yaseim Lecha Shalom. Psychological health. You can be the wealthiest person, you can be the most brilliant person, but if you don't have psychological health, if you have insecurities, if you have problems, if you have, we all know people, they have psychological ghosts that haunt them. If there's no shleimus ha'adam, shalom from the word shleimut, then it's all worthless. So those 60 words, ko sevarachu, where is the providential blessing? of wealth and in, in maintaining the wealth, of spiritual growth, of enlightenment. Do you know we have today a Jewish nation, and it's our responsibility. We have a Jewish nation today, both here in America and in other parts of the world. Most of the Jewish people can't tell the difference between an Aleph and a Bet. Most of the Jewish people in the world today cannot fill in the blank. Avraham, Yitzchak, and fill in the blank. They can't do it. We need Ya'er Hashem. We need that Kosev Aruchu. And Shlemus, how can we have peace, psychological health, when only 60 years after the Churban, 60 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, 65, I apologize, after the liberation of Auschwitz, once again, we are the pariah nation. We are the pariah nation of the world. Unless you think that we are insulated in America, lest you make that mistake, I ask of you to go to any major campus. Go during Israel Apartheid Week. These people don't even know what the definition of apartheid is, how they pervert and bastardize that word. And it, why can you, bl you blame them? It was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. It was a former president of the United States that used that term. And after he went to 60 different campuses, he finally apologized to Israel. He apologized to the Jewish people. His apology didn't make the front page. His apology was not a 60-campus tour. And go there and watch the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement that takes place on any major American campus. No, this is not England. No, this is not London. This is not Oxford. This is not Cambridge. You know where this is? This is in almost every state of the Union. 65 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, and once again we are a pariah nation. Eiko. Eiko patz lako veveracham kedoshecha b'shu v'chosid haber hu marlik doshecha. When Bilam at the behest of, of the Midianites, primarily of the Moabites and Balak, when he wanted to find a way of undermining, destroying the Jewish people, to curse the Jewish people, what happened? God turned it around. He blessed the Jewish people. Where is that? When our enemies are looking to attack us, to destroy us, to do anything to undermine us, where is the humar, tumura, the switching and transforming it into a blessing? Where is that kosedaber? Vein ata tsaru al ir kodshecha. Where is the taking of a body known as Shevet Levi, purifying them, transforming them so they could be educators and teachers? They could work in the base of Mikdash, which would be the educational institution not only of the Jewish people but of the world. Ki mitzion teitzei Torah, from the base of Mikdash teitzei Torah. Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim. And who's the ones that ran that institution? The Kohanim and the Levim. Where's the Kosa Selahem? Turning them into this group of educators. Vehein ata ra'ashu vehir ishu shamecha la'aretz chililu mishkan shamecha. When God wanted Jericho, that was this huge fortress that was impregnable, could come crumbling down within a week. 
a week after the command was given and Jericho was destroyed. That's how we come in to take over the land. Where is that? Where is that speedy redemption? Where is that ability of the Jewish people to do that? Our northern border. We just suffered. You know the psychological trauma that's going to live with these children the rest of their lives? I went there. They do art therapy with them. Because the kids can't talk about it. They're traumatized. So they, the way they get it out is the kids draw pictures and they paint pictures and you see what's going on inside of them. These kids are going to be traumatized for life. And it's true of the kids in Stay Rote. And it's true of those who suffered during the Intifada, who lost their parents, who were in bombs or schools that were blown up, were maimed, saw their friends be killed in front of them. And what's happening? Hamas now has how many rockets? We know Hezbollah that we know of has 40,000 rockets. They're the arm of Iran. They're the arm of Syria. So that notion of coming in, stopping the enemies that are a threat to you, and being able to live in peace, where is that, Co? Where is the story of Yericho all over again? And Eiko Teshuas Asame Otsar Becho Amar Shar Lechozim Natsar. The final ko is all of the ko mar shems that the Nevi'im say. I'm, the, the, this line of the Kalir is specifically referring to the last words we said last night in davening. We said, kakasuva yad as it says through your prophet Zechariah. I'm quoting from the first parak of Zechariah Hanavi, Pasuk uh, Tezayin, Yud Zayin 16 and 17. Lachain ko mar shem, thus saith the Lord. Here's the ko that he's referring to, a ko. Ko mar shem, shavti Yerush, I will return to Jerusalem, barachamim. You know, we have a principle. We're going to talk about it in the 26th Kina. That Shechinta Begalusa, not only are we a diaspora people, not only are we an exile nation, but God goes into exile with us. The Almighty Himself will return. Beisi Yivneba, Yiboneba, my house will be rebuilt once again. The Kav Yinata Yerushalayim. Once again, you know, the, the, the surveyor's mark to de develop Yerushalayim will be extended over Jerusalem. Ode Karale Mor, and he said as follows, Kol Mar Shem Tzvakos, thus saith the Lord, tells Zechariah should say in the name of God, Ode Tifutseno Arai Mito Venicham Hashem Od Es Zion. Once again, God will have comfort over the destruction of the Mikdash. He will rebuild it. Ubachar Od Birushalayim. He once again will choose Jerusalem. At this point, let's skip to Yud Zion. We, actually, I'm sorry, we want to do Tess Zion, 16. I'm not going, we're not going to read all of it. We're not going to explain all of it. Most of it we'll read to ourselves, but there are certain key lines here. This, of course, is describing the destruction of the Bayashani. We said that what happened after the Romans pierced through the walls on the 17th of Tammuz, there was hand-to-hand -hand combat on the streets for three weeks, a very, very short distance between Shar Yafo in the base of Mikdash. And thousands died. There were literally rivers of blood in Yerushalayim in these battles. What happened was the following. On the 9th of Av, Titus, now who's Titus? He's the general. His father, Vespasian, started the siege. When his father was called back to Rome, was declared Caesar, hail Caesar, he wanted to make sure that Jerusalem would fall. And that's why he appointed his son Titus to finish the job. Zachor Eis Asher Asat Tsar Bifnim, the 16th king of Tezayin. Look at what the oppressor did, Bifnim, in the inside. Shalav Charbo Valif Naivalifnim. He took his sword and he pierced the parochas. Right, the parochas, just to give a quick review, we know there's one building in the base of Mikdash. Only one building. It's called the Heichal. Only Kohanim can go into the Heichal. The Heichal consists of two areas, the Kodesh, two-thirds of it. That is what? Where the menorah is, where the golden altar is, where the, the lechem upon him, the showbread is, the table with the lechem upon him. Then there's a parochas. Look, the parochas, it separates between what? Between the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kadashim. So in the bias Rishon, what existed in the Kodesh Kadashim? You had the Aaron Kodesh, the Holy Ark. Yoshiao Melech saw what was happening. He actually hid it in those caverns underneath the base of Mikdash. We have a tradition 
that the ark is still there. The, the Arabs, with all their excavations that they've done over the last decade during the Barak administration, when Ibn Barak, one of his lack of sensitivity to Jewish history, one of the great mistakes he allowed was to allow them to do excavations there and just dig up. All, you, know, you, know, you know the archaeological treasures we have? Just from their garbage dumps, from the Palestinian garbage dumps that we have? But they destroyed the, the whole history, the Jewish antiquities that they destroyed, trying to erase 3,000 years of Jerusalem? Well, what happened? The Aron Kodesh was there. In the Bayashani, all that existed was the Evan Shasia, the stone. What, what the Arabs call today the Dome of, Dome of the Rock, or the, technically it's known as the Shrine of Omar. The Shrine of Omar is over that rock, that Evan Shasia. The reason why it's much bigger, and many of you, you can see pictures of it. They take pictures of it. The reason it's much bigger today than it was in the time of the Bayashani is very simply. They've carved off a, a meter, a number of meters from the Temple Mount. You know, they just carved it off so it looks like a big rock. Then it was a small little stone, a small little projection. So he goes in there. He, first, he slashes, he slashes the parochas. And what does he do? He cuts down the parochas and he uses his bedding. He takes a prostitute and he fornicates with a prostitute in the Holy of Holies. The place that only one day a year the Kohen Gadol was allowed to go, only with the special process of the Ketores and the blood of the Par and the blood of the Sa'ir, only one day a year. So he goes in there. So he asks, how could this be? How could he desecrate it? It's very simple. To quote the Kalir and the Tinos, Ki ein ha'ish beveso. Because God left. I'm using anthropomorphic terms. Don't take me literally. The reason, again, that we observe Tisha B'Av today and not tomorrow, tomorrow was the day of the primary destruction. Today was only a partial. They came in in the afternoon. Why is today Tisha B'Av? Because Sila Kashchina. Because that providential, intense relationship, God removed himself. He never... Titus could have never come with the prostitute into the Holy of Holies if God had not left. Just for those on the, the cast on the computer, we have members of Hatzalah, and they were just called on a Hatzalah call. That was the noise in the background. The, um, that's why we mourn. Just if I could make a, this is a side comment, but an important comment. You notice we start saying Nachem in the afternoon after Hatzos. Once again, we say, Tiskabel, God, you should accept our prayers. Why is it that if historically the events didn't take place now, it's not now, now is the fighting, the battle's going on. They haven't entered the Mikdash till this afternoon. Shouldn't there be a more intense form of mourning with a U, of Avelus? Shouldn't there be a more intense mourning or Avelus in the afternoon? So Rabbi Salvechik explained the following, no. It goes back to the idea that we said about Mizmor Le'asaf instead of Kina Le'asaf. The fact that Hishlich Kaso al Eitzim Vavanim, the fact that God took out the, the anger, the Midas Hadin, God doesn't get angry, he's not a human being that has emotions. When we say the anger of God, we mean the Midas Hadin. The fact that it was taken out on a building, on a property, instead of on the Jewish nation, instead of the annihilation of the Jewish people, that is the greatest Nechama, that the Jews survived that we've survived the last two millennia and haven't been annihilated despite every attempt in almost every century to do that to us. That is the greatest nechama. And that's why, if anything, there's less of an intense. You know what happens at, at Chatzos after we finish the Kinos? You know what happens? We go from a modality of Misha Mesa Mutalafana from the funeral, we go into a modality of what? Of Shloshim. We're in, still in Avelis. We're still in mourning, but of Shloshim. That's why we put on the tefillin. Rambam quotes that there are many, many of the righteous who could really appreciate the, the real, the Tamidei Chachamim who could appreciate the nature of the Chorban. Many of them wouldn't wear the tefillin Shalrosh all day. We of the Minag, we put it on. We do put on the tefillin Shalrosh. We don't sit on the low ground. We say Tisgabel at Mincha. God should accept our prayers. We say nachem. We ask God to, we don't do that in the morning. We don't do that the night before. There's no nechama. When Misha may some to the front of when the dead is laying in front of you, when you're attending the funeral, there's no nechama. This afternoon there's nechama. Why? The fact that hishlich ka'aso al eitzim vavanim and not al am Yisrael, 
What did we say before? Kilaya chuyavti. That's the greatest nechama. Greatest nechama. So let's read a few key lines here. Yisomim gil b'magen ma'adam v'yamad mikab b'mar adam dam mimenu dalach v'hishker chitzav midam. Literally, their, their, their swords, their arrows became intoxicated with blood. That's how many Jews were killed in the battle for Jerusalem. Let's read this together. Our progenitors, story, the story of Nadav and Avihu, Zora They were killed. They died for, for, for offering strange incense in the Heichal. They didn't even go into the Kodesh Kedoshim. Vizeh, in Titus, Soa, Zona, Hichnes, he brings a prostitute into the Holy of Holies, and he is not consumed by fire. How can it be that the place which had the divine fire, one of the miracles in the Bayes Rishon was that the fire, in Bayes Shani as well, the fire never went out. Even when there was a rainstorm over Jerusalem, the fire didn't go out. But yet what? Yet it could be destroyed by the fire of the, of the Romans. Binafshenu, this is important, this, this, this paragraph. Binafshenu tavanu kehotzi klishares, vishamam ba'ani shayit bam lihishares. What is this? They took, you know the march of Titus. Well, you know what the arch of Titus is, but the whole march through Rome with the vessels of the base of Mikdash. They took them out the Jaffa Gate. They, why is it the Jaffa Gate? Because you go directly west and the road takes you, the highway takes you to where? To Jaffa Port. Today, Jaffa Port is not much of a port because the sand is settled there. But Jaffa Port used to be like what Haifa is. You know how Haifa and Ashdod have a, dred, they have a 24-hour dredging project? So that way it's a, deep, it's a deep water port? That's what Haifa used to be. I'm sorry, Jaffa used to be. And what did they do? They had ships. They had the Roman ships there. And they shipped the, 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 the Kalim of the Beis Amikdash to Rome. We believe that many of these kalim ad hayomaz till this day are still in the Vatican. That the Vatican, that the Catholic Church, has many of the kalim from the base of Mikdash. One thing is very clear. From, from, from the, the historical accounts of the Romans, from Josephus Flavius, from, from the Arch of Titus, you see that they took kalim. The menorah there is not the, the menorah that the Kohanim lit every day. It was different. Those were different menorahs. Those are menorahs that were for illumination. But, but you see very clearly that this, this description that the Kalir gives. Every night before the Kohanim went, you know, finished their work in the base of Mikdash, they prepared the 93 klisharis. There were 93 different vessels used. When they came that morning, they were gone. The Romans came in and taken them. Nashim kisharu kivo aritz. Aritz is the oppressor, the, the tyrant. Bekarka habayis nalatz charitz. Sarim lupasu bevo paritz beveis kodesh hakadoshim tzachanoz hishritz. See, the young, were, they were naive and they were foolish. The young said, no, nah, we'll defeat the Romans. We'll stop the Romans. We're gonna, we have the ability. We can do it. You know? we're, the, we're the fighters. We're the tough ones. But you know what? The older Jews, they knew. They saw what was happening. They weren't as arrogant. They weren't as naive. It's as if God is, is incarcerated. He's tied and shackled down. Here we thought that now that there was no longer a Babylonia and we had a t- base of Mikdash, it would be forever. But the, the red one came. Who's the red one? Esav. Rome is a descendant of Esav. The descendants of, 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 of Yaakov. Adkinutash midok armon. This is very interesting. He appointed four, four colonels or commanders. Biyad arbo roshe tafsarav lahachrivo. He said, "Each of you destroy one of the walls." Now, you and I have all been. We've all been to see the temple tunnels. We know the huge construction project of the creation and the foundations of the whole retaining wall of the Temple Mount. What did Herod do? He literally, it was a mountain that on its northern end, the Harabais was, was higher, and it sloped to the south. Herod took all that mountain off the north. He made it a flat mountain. And what did he do with all those stones? What do they call them? The Oxlers? There's, there's a name for them. What? Ash, ashlers, right. He took them and he made Ashlers out of them. And what we call the, the, 
the stones, they're not stones, they're huge, huge building stones of the Harbaeus. So he had one general, one colonel, take troops, and each one's job was to destroy one of the four retaining walls of the base of Mikdash. So three of them were successful. One of them was not. Which one? The Kosel Hamaravi. Right? So we see one piece. What we call the Kotel is just a small piece on the southern end. When you go through the temple tunnels, you see most of the western wall was not destroyed. It retained itself. Al-Tzad Ma'aravi l'zecher hisridbo. God enabled that there should be some zecher of the temple, of the Beis HaMikdash, and that is the western retaining wall. V'tzag achar kaslenu v'lo rav rivo. It's as if God was standing behind the wall, not allowing it to fall and be knocked down the way the southern, eastern, and northern walls were. This is important. This is referring to a Gemara in Masech the Gitten on Daf Nun Zayin Omid Beis. What does that mean, the three ships? You sent them to Eretz Utz in the three ships. Let me read one more paragraph, to, then we'll go back. Hashi veinu shivu, please God, bring us back from the depths of the sea if we commit suicide. Kivo benev cheyam. Veshitvu atzmam yachad. They said the Shema, and then they committed suicide. Lin pol bayam. Shir v'sush bachal shoreru ka'ala yam. They also sang a song, but it wasn't the song of the Yamsuf. It wasn't Az Yashir Moshe. But what ki alecha haragnu bimsulos yam. This is Perek Mem Dalad of Tehillim, Psalm 44. Ki alecha haragnu kol yam. What was the case? They were young, handsome. The boys were very handsome. The girls were beautiful, young men and women, in late adolescents, early 20s. And they were going to be sold as sex objects, as sex toys on the Roman market. So every Roman who had a few bucks, few free, could you know, get himself a Jewish girl. Homosexuality was, was very rampant in Rome. So any Rome, you know, they were bisexual, many of the Roman aristocracy, so they could have a, a young man, a young Jewish boy as a, a plaything for sexual purposes. So what happened? The girls took the initiative. See, many Jews were taken and shipped from the Jaffa port and sold on the Roman slave market. But most of them were sold for what purpose? They were sold for, to be slave laborers. These were not being sold for slave laborers. These were being sold for, for, for prostitutional purposes, private prostitutional purposes. And the girls wanted to know, would it be a violation of suicide, of killing oneself, if they jumped into the Mediterranean? B'niv cheyam, to quote the Kalir. And they, they analyzed it, and they discussed it with each other, and they realized not. They would be brought back mi bashan, they would be brought back, I mean, this is all quoting, they, 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 they derived this from Kapitel Memdal, the 44th Psalm. The boy said, look, if the girls, who first of all, a, a woman in the sexual act is passive, we know this from the Gemara describing why Esther was allowed to be with Ahasuerus, right? Is passive, she wasn't forced to give up her life. A male who it's not the derech, it's not the regular way of intimacy, if they're going to be violated in an irregular way, kal v'chomer. So after the girls committed suicide, the, men's committed, the men committed suicide. What was the song of the sea? It wasn't the song of the sea as the Jews tra traversed through the Reed Sea. Az yashir Moshe of Yisrael zashir azos. It was a very different sea, a very different song. It was Psalm 44 that they sang. This story is not just the story of what happened of the youth in the time of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. Leo Young was sent a letter which he was able to publish in the New York Times in 1943. The letter was the story of a letter written and given to someone who was able to get this out of the ghetto of the girls of the Beis Yaakov, well, we, really the forerunner to Beis Yaakov, as we know, is what's called the Sarah Schneer schools, right? The Sarah Schneer. She was the mother of, of, the, of, of Jewish education for women, the mother of the Beis Yaakov. And the SS gave these girls, they put them in a separate building in the Warsaw Ghetto, 
They brought lingerie. They brought different types of soaps and perfumes. And he told them to prepare themselves. And the girls, some of them young adolescents, some of them later adolescents, some of them were the counselors and teachers in their young 20s, were able to procure cyanide, some form of poison. And they wrote a letter before committing suicide. Rather than being violated by the Nazi SS, they committed suicide. And it's a very powerful letter. I apologize. I have it at home. I didn't bring it. It was, again, published in the New York Times. And um, they asked one thing. You should remember us, and you should say Kaddish for us. And this is the story throughout Jewish history. This is the story of Jewish women when the Cossacks, the Ukrainian Cossacks, came in. You know what's disgusting? When you go to Kiev today, one of the largest structures in Kiev, Ukraine, is a huge statue in honor of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. The reason that he's a Ukrainian hero is because here he was. He was a, a captain in the Polish army, and he was not given. There's two, there's two uh, accounts of the story, either that they violated his wife when he was gone, that's one story. I'm not sure if that's true or not. The other story is that he was passed over for a, um, what's it called when you, you move up the rank? What? A promotion. a promotion. He was passed over for a promotion instead of being you know, lifted up to a next level. So it wasn't the first time, but he was so furious with the Polish Catholics, and there was a natural animosity the Ukrainians who are Eastern Orthodox had against the Polish Catholics, that they... Uh, He's, he was able to unite, and then they hired. Many, by the way, many of the Polish soldiers were Ukrainians, so they had training in military. And he brought in these Tartar mercenaries. It was a, 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 absolute barbarians. You know, we're talking the 17th century. These people were still barbarians. And the Ukrainians with their Tartar mercenaries, they started going through, and they really had two objects. Object number one of their wrath were Polish priests. They, they tortured the, Pol the Catholic priests because they represented the Polish religion, Catholicism. The second group, and the primary group, were the Jews. The Jews, because, you know, there's limits what a Jew could do. A Jew couldn't be a farmer, there were land laws, etc. But Jews could be middlemen. And the Poles liked the Jews. They were good businessmen, the Jews. So the Poles used them as their middlemen. They collected the taxes from the Ukrainians in Ukraine, in what we call southern and uh, eastern Galicia. And uh, the Ukrainians went through town after town, and their, the object was the Jews. Because, by the way, not all the Jews were innocent. There were Jewish people who ran the inns. You know, today we have a bar, you know, we have a, a watering hole there. The bars were associated usually with, with a type of inn. You, know, you could sleep there like a bed and breakfast. And what happened? The Ukrainian would get drunk, and they had a big drinking problem in Eastern Europe. And he gives you, I'm using a modern term, let's say he gives you a $20 bill. And you give him change for a 10. Well, that's stealing. That's called taking advantage of a drunkard. You know, and there was a lot of animosity. Whether it was right or wrong, the Ukrainians had animosity because they, they wasted all their money at the bar. And who was the one running the bar? Who could the Poles trust? The Poles trusted the Jew that they would get their money back. You know, take the money and get, send it back to Poland. And we were the wrath. Thousands upon thousands of Jews were sold as slaves. It took us decades to go throughout the Ottoman Empire redeeming our own brothers, very much like what happened under the Roman captivity. You know, thousands of Jews were sold on the Roman slave market. And what happened was, you're all familiar with the supply and demand curve. What happens? When you have the same demand and there's a huge supply, the price goes down. So Jews, over a period of time on the Roman slave market and then repeated in history in the uh, late 17th century, went... We went to literally redeeming our brothers and sisters who were sold as slaves. But not everyone was that lucky that they were sold as a slave. Over 100,000 Jews minimally were murdered. We don't have records, so I can't give you exact records. We know for sure it was over 100,000. It may have been as many as 300,000 Jews. Now, just keep in mind, during this time in, in history, they didn't have Zyklon B like they did in Auschwitz. They didn't even have carbon monoxide like they did in Belzec or like they did in Treblinka. This was killing by hand, knives and swords. They didn't have, you know, sophisticated guns at that time. If they had guns, it was one bullet. Do you know how many Jews were killed one by one by one? They described the Dnieper River. The Dnieper River was red 
I mean, this is something you could only imagine a scene in a movie. It was red when these different towns were being, Jews were being slaughtered along the Nieper. I'm not sure if it's pronounced Nieper. D-N-I-E-P-E-R. That's how it's, how it's in English, how it's written. Jewish women were, were just violated. And Jewish women committed suicide not to be, but they were hor horrifically violated by these animals. This is what the Khalil is writing about. They're allowed to commit suicide under these circumstances. Suicide is a grave offense. In Judaism, we don't have a word suicide. It's self-murder. It's a, it's a manifestation of murder. You can murder someone else. You can murder yourself. But there's a matir. There's a license under these circumstances. And this is nebuch. This is nebuch what they were facing. Ki sahomos boad nafshan. The tahom, the depth, came until it calls those ba'asnu v'lo This is what has become of us. But yet, in the midst of us, God, we will never forget you in the midst of all of this. Tikvasam nasnu lameshiv mi bashan. Ubaskol nishma ura ura lamasishan. If we could please go to 17, Yud Zayin. Im tochal nanashim pir yamol alei tfuchim nebuch. When the children would die under the, in the siege of Yerushalayim, Yermiao describes there was no food. They end up eating what? They ended up eating the dead carcasses of their own children. These children, that they, you don't think about a Jewish mother. She goes to the doctor. Oh, my little Moshe, my little Yankel, he grew up a quarter of an inch in the last month, you know. Oh, he put on two pounds, you know, and the grandmother's so happy, you know, he's growing, right? That preciousness in, in the way the child grows, the same mothers, these same mothers who, who pampered their children ended up cooking their children because they were starving to death. And after the children died, the children died of starvation. They ended up having to eat the flesh of their own children. This is the description Yermiao gave us of the siege of Jerusalem. This is a story. Marta Bas Baisus. Any of you have read the, the, the Medrash? I think the Gemara quotes this Medrash. She was a young woman. And she had beautiful long hair. They took her hair and they tied it to two horses. And then they whapped it, and the two horses ran, and they just ripped her apart, you know, just driving her Her bones were crushed. And what she did was that she shouldn't be defiled and, you know, as she's being killed in such a heinous way. She, took, she had bobby pins, and she took the bobby pins, and she pierced her dress into the skin so that, you know, while she's being wrenched to death like this, she, you know, she shouldn't be exposed in an, in an inappropriate way. This story, the Rav said, took place to his first cousin. We all know Reb Chaim's sons. There were two great sons. There was a third son that went to Switzerland. The two great sons is, of course, the Briska Rav and Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, the Rav's father. But Reb Chaim had a daughter. And the daughter, her, um, her son, I think his name was Reb Hirsch Glickson. Reb Chaim's granddaughter, I apologize what I said. The son-in-law's name was, I think, Rep. Hirsch Glickson. The granddaughter, I'm sorry, the grandson and his wife, it was their week in Poland. It was the week of Sheva Brachas. So we're talking about Rep. Chaim's grandson, the son of Rep. Chaim's daughter. It was the week of Sheva Brachas. And guess what happened? The SS came into town. You know what happened. The Wehrmacht came in September of, of, of 39. In September, October, the Polish army did not put up much of a fight. After the Wehrmacht comes in, the SS comes in. And what happened? They would get, gather up the Jews. Many of them started killing Jews right away, taking them out to the forest. Right now, there's a Catholic priest, and his whole life is committed to finding these mass graves. We know many of them, Tiko Chin, others. We know many of the mass graves where Jews were killed. Their own Polish neighbors brought them out there, marched them out there, shot them. Sometimes it was the SS who shot them. First, the Jews were forced to dig their own graves. They had to dig their own graves, and they lined them up, shot them dead into it, and then the Polish Catholics covered the graves. So only now, 
from some of the elderly Polish Catholics who remember and can identify, are we identifying these mass graves? But this was not a mass grave. This was a case where this chassan and kala were talking about in the first week of their marriage. One was taken and tied to one automobile. The other was taken and tied to another automobile. And the SS started going through the streets of the town, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour in an area that you would only drive 10 or 20 miles with their bodies attached to it. They killed them by, by just running them through the towns like that. This is, this is what happened to our people. Im tibak l'shon yonech l'chech. My tongue cleaves to its palace. Here it's the, the, the yonek, the, the, the baby, because there's nothing. There's no, there's no milk. The mother is so malnutritioned, so malnourished, that she has no milk to, for her baby to suckle. Literally, they cut, they cut the bodies into sections. They cut us apart. The mothers literally bend over their dead children. That's referring to what? That's talking about how the Jews went after Churban Bayis Rishon. They went to the Arabs, the descendants of Ishmael. Instead of them giving us basic, they gave us salty foods and then empty flasks, flasks of, of air. That's the translation of that. We went from a thousand down to a hundred, from a hundred to ten, from ten to one. Remember, we spoke about the Polish city of Tarnov? 44,000 Jews in that city. You know how many survived? Guess. Not, not 400. Not one percent. Not even one percent survived. Do you know how many people we have to this day? They're the only survivor of their town. And it's not one town. It's not two towns. It's not a hundred towns. It's a thousand. It's, a, it's thousands of communities. Lithuanian Jewry, eight percent survived. Lithuania. The only Lithuanian Jews today are the South African Jews, because they left you know, way before. They left you know, 30 years before the Shoah. But the Jews who were in Lithuania in 1930, well, actually 1941. And 41 is when Hitler broke the pact with Stalin. And then the SS, of course, came. You all know the story of the Kovna ghetto, of Riga. And what happened? Of Lithuanian Jewry, only 8% survived. It's not one in ten. I think Polish Jewry, if I'm correct, I think was about one in, I think one, eleven percent, something like that. Somewhere around one in ten survived. The only reason in, in Los Angeles you have a lot of Slovakian and Hungarian survivors. The reason why is because the, the deportation and the killing of, of Hungarian Jewry didn't start until the spring of 1944. Nebuch, now we're losing the survivors. But for instance, you take the shul where I was at, Beth Jacob, in its heyday, they had to make hosafos upon hosafos in May and June, uh, uh, Shavuos time especially. Why? Because that's when the deportations, that's when Eichmann deported the Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz. So everyone had lost most of their family. And you, you're not going to tell a survivor, you can't have an aliyah. We only give seven aliyahs. What do you do on Yom Tov? You have to have multiple minyanim. You can only have five aliyahs on a Yom Tov. Who are you going to, which survivor can get an aliyah in memory of their kadoshim? Which can't? Because on Shavuos, you know, many people observe who not sure the exact date when, when their loved ones were killed. They observe Shavuos as the yard site. But at least... Hungarian Jews, some survived. 
Polish Jews, the war started for them in 39. Lithuanian Jews in 41. How many of you think are going to survive from 41 to 45? How many of you think are going to survive from 39 to 45? That's why you have 8%. That's why you have 10%, 11%. We'll talk about the 80,000 Kohanim who were killed. We've mentioned it, but we'll talk about that in Lama This is a terrible line. This is a oh, horrific line. 300 infants hung, I'm sorry, sorry, heaped on one stove nine large measures of crushed children's brains. Tisha kabin mochi yiladim munachim. The rav on this line, and we're going to come across it in other places. See, one thing that people who want to annihilate the Jews, let's take the SS, they loved to murder and kill children. They loved it. You know why? They, 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 they relished in it. What, could, what sickness, is, can you explain the sickness of butchering children? Yes because it's the end of the next generation. It's the annihilation of the Jewish people. Because by killing the children, you've killed the future. You've, you've stifled the future. Many of you know who Max Webb is. Chappelle and Webb, the developers here. Max is the, the brother-in-law of David and, and of Nathan. Max told me this story himself, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm telling you this secondhand. Max was a young man. I think he was 16 or 17 years old. In 39, as we said, after the Wehrmacht came in, the SS came in. He happened to be outside the hospital in his town. The SS goes into the hospital and they ask the director of the hospital, who are the Jewish patients? So he go, they go in, listen to this, they go into the maternity ward. They take the babies in the SS are clubbing these babies. They're anywhere between a day and two weeks old. They're clubbing the baby skulls against the wall of the hospital, clubbing so the brains are splattering all over. This story, Max says, I saw this with my own eyes. Then they took the mothers out. These are women who can barely walk. They've just given birth. They took the mothers out and executed them. This is before Auschwitz. This is before Birkenau. This is already 1939. He runs home to his mother, and he tells his mother, what he says, Ma, he's not a liar. He says, I'm not making this up. I saw this with my own eyes. And she says, Meshala, Max, his name was Moshe in Hebrew. She says, listen, I've got two little children. You've, you've got to go. You've have, you run, you take care of yourself. I can't abandon little children. I have to look after your siblings. It was the last time he ever saw his mother. Never saw his father again, never saw his siblings, never saw his mother. They were all killed. Only one who survived. This is not just antiquities. This is our generation. This is our lifetime, this story. What did they do? They took the Jewish children and they hung them on a branch. The dead Jew, they hung Jewish children. They hung their bodies on a dead Jewish branch, on a, on a branch. The Rav Tavachim, of course, was Nevuzaradan, the general of the Babylonian forces. These were Jewish girls. They were modest Jewish girls. It was unheard of that a Jewish girl would get married who wasn't a virgin. These were extremely modest, humble girls. And the girls of the aristocracy, they took them and they raped them on the roadside. In public, they raped them on the roadside. In tashachaf nebein shvatayim, benos malachim meshubachim you know what the death march was. The Russians were coming. 
the Russians were coming to liberate the camps, so they started marching them back towards Germany, not feeding them anything. And these people who were so malnourished, who had no caloric intake to start with, one by one collapsed by the road. And as they're lying there dying of, of dying, because they, they can't even crawl, no less walk, the SS, the Nazis, would come and shoot them. This happened in our generation. Look at the last two lines. How can it be, Almighty, that you allow this, that the women have to eat the, the flesh of their own dead children? How can you allow this? And God responds, How can you allow the murder of Zechariah Hanavi in the base of Mikdash on Yom Kippur, which fell on Shabbos, a Navi and a Kohen. How can you allow that? Why have you as a society never made amends and corrected that? Turn now to Kina Yud Tes, the 19th Kina. We know the following principle. Rabbeinu Bachia says this in the Chovas Halavavos. Probably the most important fundamental principle in our theology is Hakaras Hatov. It's, is, we think of it as what ethical monotheism. We think of it in terms of tzedakah, Shabbos, Talmud Torah, Talmud Torah, Kenegit Kulam. Those are the great principles of the Torah, correct? Rabbeinu Bachia says the, 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 the conditio sine qua non, the most essential foundation of our theology before everything else is gratitude. Whether it's gratitude towards a parent, gratitude towards someone who's done good to us, to an employer, gratitude towards the Almighty, if we don't have gratitude as a Jewish people, it's the beginning of, of, of the downfall. It's the beginning of all other flaws is not having proper gratitude. And we end off, and this is based upon the kinos of Eicha, what Yirmiyahu did, the Khalir does the same thing. But we turn from questions to a stage of Tzidok Adin. And we say in this kinah two things. Number one is, Ribbonu Olam, we were ingrates. We, we, we were ingrates. And anything that has befallen us is Tzidok Adin. We acknowledge that it was just. You were not whimsical. You were not absent. You were not wrong, God forbid. But what? We corrupted our ways. We perverted our ways. And instead of being a mamleches kohanim v'goy kadosh, we lived like everyone else, it was all about us, it was about our needs, and we failed to have a sense of humility, and we failed to have a sense of gratitude for the opportunity you afforded us. To you, God is right. You, you were right. The various wonders that you have done throughout our history. How humiliated are we? We've rejected you, and we not just rejected you, forgotten you, we've abhorred you. You took, as we read in the laning this morning, a nation from, from the midst of a nation. Mitzrayim was described as the Kur Habarzel, the, the iron furnace. No one ever made it out of Egypt. It was a cauldron. No one ever made it out. And you took a nation from the midst of a nation out of it? Volanu Boshes upon him. How humiliated, how embarrassed are we, the ingrates that we are, Bidofi Asher Nimsavanu Kimaseyamasos. Instead of what? Instead of following your system, we ended up mocking and acting like them. You redeemed us, as you promised. You redeemed us from Egypt. And what did we do? We turned around. How humiliated are we? As you're redeeming us, you know, going through the Yamsuf, we rejected you. We, we, we rebelled. Oh, you brought us out to kill us in the desert. There wasn't... There weren't enough graves in Egypt. You had to come and bring us out and kill us in the desert. I'm sorry, I, I, we read that. We became your witnesses, your partners. We turned around 40 days later with the golden calf. 
Lechad Anoi Hatzedaka Betam Shitam the Kitzapichas Bidvash. You gave us a food that number one was light on the digestive system. Number two is it would taste like anything that you wanted it to taste like. But what did we do? Velanu Boshes Haponim Beyom He Kravnu the fun of Solus Veshem and Dvash. We offered to the Avodazaras things that you're not supposed to offer. You're not supposed to offer anything to an Avodazara. But we took Shem and Dvash and we used it to offer it to them. We had the three, the, the manna, the, the, again the food, the be'er is the water source that we had in the desert, and the amud anan, to protect us from the heat of the desert. We had the ananea kava, the clouds of glory, and they also, they cleared the mountains for us, they, they, they prevented the scorpions and the snakes from attacking us. So we had this whole system of protection that provided for all of our needs. It was literally, it was a, it was a specific providential existence. And what happens? We, we, we cursed it. We said, ah, what kind of garbage is that? You can't even feel full. You know, when you eat a steak, there's a geschmack. You feel your belly's full. You're, you're stuffed. You, feel, you like that feeling, right? We couldn't even feel it. This could taste like steak. This could taste like filet mignon. But, you know, what kind of sick, crazy food is it? God did us a favor. It was totally digested within the system. You didn't have to, you didn't have to you excrete it. There was no feces in the midbar. So instead of appreciating that, appreciating that, that we didn't have to dig latrines, we didn't have to expose ourselves, you know, in, 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 you know, in a way which is uh, you know, debasing. No, we mocked it. We attacked it. We complained about it. We lack nothing in the desert. That, of course, is the illusions that Moshe makes at all the different stages where we rebelled against God, whether it was the sin of the spies, whether it was the rebellion of Korach, whether it was the golden calf, whether it was mocking the man, whatever it was. The righteousness. God gave us not just the promised land of Israel, he gave us the whole east side of the Jordan River. Today, most of today's Jordan, the Golan Heights, a good part of today's Syria. All of this was given, and that's where all the water sources are from. So what a blessing. And what do we do? We became so wealthy from the spoils of the Amorite kings of the east bank of the Jordan River, from Og Melech Abashan, the northern Amorite kingdoms. We were so wealthy and so rich. One city, the Rabboni Sholem said, don't take from the spoils of Yericho, of Jericho, for one city, and that we couldn't do. We couldn't keep our grubby paws off the gelt. How humiliated are we? We didn't even need it. A chazer, we were chazerim. Problem sometimes today. The wealth we have, I'm talking about those of us who are middle class, the wealth in the luxury, luxuries and the comforts and the change of clothing, in the, in, in the comforts of, of an air condition in a heated house, in the quality of food that we get, in the uh, different types of food that we get, in the vacations that we have, even those of us who have a real challenge with day school tuition and everything else. Our ancestors could never have dreamed of such a thing. In like a bunch of chazerim, we have to dray on the taxes. Got to cheat on taxes, right? Got to play other games in business. Always got to have an edge. It's sick. That's exactly what he's talking about here. We should be humiliated of such things. This government, this country, the United States of America, we've never had a malchus achesed. We've never had a diaspora this golden. We all know there's no such thing as the golden age of Spain, the golden year of Spain. It was made up by the German Jews. It was made up by the early Zionists to, de to, to, to deal with the fact of what it's like when you're acculturated into a secular environment. What will it be like when we, we go back to Palestine with all the Arabs there? You know, of course they're going to get along with us. It's not like the uh, Judeo-Christian relations of the medieval times. It'll be a glorious time like it was in the golden year of Spain. There was never a golden year of Spain. The famous Shmuel Anagid, the great vizier who ran the government in Andalusia, the Islamic government in southern Spain, the great Jew. Guess what happened to his son, Yosef Anagid? When things weren't going well in the government, they had to find a scapegoat. So who do you blame the Jew? They executed his son, Yosef Anagid. It was not so golden. The Rambam, right? The great neo Aristotelian philosopher. It's the, the Rambam, his whole family, after being Dayanim for generations in Cordova, what happened? They had to flee. They had to flee to North Africa, and then from, from Morocco, they had to flee to Fostat, to, to Egypt. 
because the Maldahuds, because these radical Islamic people who, who killed anyone that did not convert to Islam. So you had two choices. You had three choices. You could die, you could flee the country, the country you'd live for hundreds of years, or you could become a Muslim. That's a golden era of Spain? Not so golden. Read, this, read the lifetime, of, read the biography, what he, what he writes about himself, the Ibn Ezra. But America is a golden Medina. We've never had it so good. A Jew has to have gratitude. It's the fundamental of our theology. A Jew who's not grateful is not a Jew. It defines what a Jew is, Rabbi Nobachia says. Lanu boshes hapanim. We stand before God on Tisha B'Av humiliated that we didn't live up to who and what we should be. You gave us 14 shoftim from the time of Yeshua through Shmuel HaNavi. Whenever there was a tzaras or there was problem, there was a shofim. Throughout that whole period of the shoftim, almost, it was almost 370 years, that period. What happened? We're walking, there's a whole group that's worshipping the Tzalem Micha. They're engaged in Avodah Zarah. You gave us the Mishkan and Shiloh, and then after that was destroyed by the Pelishti, and then there was the temporary stages you gave us of Nov and Givon, and then you gave us a first base of Mikdash, and after that was destroyed, you gave us a second base of Mikdash. God, you enabled us to have that intense relationship, that providential relationship, where we could function as a people. One after another, stage after stage, you took care of us. And how humiliated are we are. Beresha shenimsa banu shecharvu ubama nachlu nichlamim. Because we wouldn't, didn't appreciate it. We corrupted it. We caused it to be destroyed and lost. Even in the destruction of Yerushalayim, even in the destruction of the temple, it was a great act of chesed. Why was it a great act of chesed? Because we survived, as we mentioned. Because the Jewish people survived. And it was the, it was the city that was destroyed. We turn to you, God, in tshuva. We turn to you remorseful, in a state of repentance. We're going to explain this line like many. See, the problem that many people have is, who is Rabbi Elazar HaKalir? Who is the, the one who holds our hands and takes us through Tisha B'Av? By the way, the Kalir you should know. Our davening Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is all, is, much of it is from the Kalir, the piyutim that we say. We don't because Nebuch in America, we, we want to get out of shul quick. I mean, this is not a comment against the Hashgama minion, but we try to rush through things and move things along. We don't say piyutim. The Rav said it when he couldn't say piyutim at Mariv, the Yom Tov is not Yom Tov without the Piyutim. The Germans, they have Krovitz. They have Piyutim in each phrase of the Amida. That's why, by the way, we didn't say it today, but the first kina this morning, you know, Shavasorim, I'm sorry, let me turn to the first kina, kina Vav. Turn to it for just a second. Hold the page. If you notice in the first kina, it starts with Shavasuru Meni. Then there's the Nun, Nafla, Samech, the Suru is from, from, from Samech, Nafla is Nun, Al Pnei Pras, Nupsu Chasid is Ayin. Why does it start if it's an acrostic? Why would you start with Samech? Why wouldn't you start with Aleph, right? Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalev, like every other acrostic. You know why? Because the first 19 were used in the brachas of the Shmon Esrei. They had Krovitz. If you go to Kal Das Yashur and Breuers, which is the, the Mesora of Frankfurt am Main Jewry, if you go to a German community, they have Krovitz on Purim, they have Krovitz on Tisha B'av. In the Amida, they have Piyutim. What's the point? Who is the Kalir? What is he? So we think that he definitely lived in Israel because the Kalir's Piyutim, the Rabbeinu Usher speaks about this. If you turn in Perak He, uh, Simen Chaf Aleph, in Masech the Brachos, read the Rush. The Rush says the following. He believes that the Kalir lived in Israel for a very simple reason because he only wrote Piyutim for first day Rosh Hashanah. There was a time in Israel where they only kept one day Rosh Hashanah. I'm not I'm talking about after the Churban, where they would come to the base of Ad, they would, would declare Rosh Hashanah, and they would keep a one day Rosh Hashanah. The Kalir is very clear, even though Tosfus says it might have been Rabbi Elezer Hagadol, there's a Tosfus in Chagiga, it might have been one of the Tanayim. 
Most of the Mephorshim hold he came, comes much later. You know why? We're going to take a look at the next kina where it talks about the Christian anti-Semitism, the theology of Justin Martyr, Byzantine Christian anti-Semitism. They controlled Israel for many years before the Muslims overthrew them. He was very aware of that. This approach of this kina says not only did maybe he live as one of the Paitanim in the 6th or 7th century in Israel. You know, you had the Gaonim in Bavel during that period, and you had certain great Talmidei Chachamim in Israel. It was a small community in Israel. Most of world Jewry, 80, 85% lived in Bavel. Probably 5 to 10% lived in North Africa. 5% lived in northern Israel. Because after the Muslims took over Israel, it became a little bit easier to live there. It was very difficult to live in Israel under Byzantine Christianity. There were were communities in the north, in the Golan Heights, and in the northern Galilee. But this line in the Kinna seems to say that he lived even later. He might have lived in the 10th century. That's how late he may have lived. Why? Let's read this line again. The Rav said it's very possible to learn this way. It's been 900 years since what? What's the 900 years? 900 years since the Chorb and Beis since the previous stanza. Meaning, I, Elazar HaKalir, am living possibly in the 10th century. And what? The sin is Kavusha. You haven't destroyed us. Even though we haven't done tshuva, we haven't rebuilt the base of Mikdash, we haven't been worthy of, of Mashiach. Nevertheless, you, God, have enabled us. You've tarried and you've, you've, we're waiting for you, but you've waited for us. The Ish Hamodos is referring to Daniel. Turn, please, just very briefly to the end of the next kinna. We're going to do the end of kinna chaf. You see the last stanza? We'll go back and do, we're going to do a few more, but let's, I want to, the last stanza is what we are alluding to. Hatei Elohai Oznecha, Hashem, incline your ear, is, is Daniel Ish Hamudo said, please incline, incline your ear, Laomrim, to the anti Semites that say the following Uzav, the Jewish people have been abandoned. Shukach, they have been forgotten. Nutash, again, forsaken. Laad Shomeim, eternally desolate. What is this? This is early Christian theology. It's, the evangelicals do not believe this. But today, it's still part of Catholic theology. That there has been a rejection of the chosen people. There has been an abrogation of the covenant. Because the Jews sinned. They didn't accept the carpenter of Nazareth as their savior. They are eternally damned. And they are condemned to eternal damnation unless they accept the carpenter of Nazareth as their salvation. There's been an abrogation of the covenant. The Jews are rejected. So then there was a big problem. The last pagan, Roman pagan emperor, his name was Julian. They call him Julian the Apostate. He's laughed, he laughed at the Christian theology and he said, come on. He says, you know, the Jews are still around. It's 400, 500 years after the destruction of the temple. If these people are eternally condemned to damnation, if these people have been rejected... Well, they look like they're making a lot of money. They look like they have beautiful communities. I understand they don't control Jerusalem, but look at them all over the world. They've rebuilt themselves. So the theology came up of what's known as the witness people. The, the witness people. What's that theology? That theology is this, that the reason the Jews have survived the millennia, the reason the Jews have been able to survive is they have to witness the second coming. And when they witness the second coming, they will admit that they were wrong in the first place. And there's a group known as the Pope's Jews. The Pope's Jews were always protected. No matter what the case of Christian anti-Semitism throughout medieval times, they were always protected. Because their job, it was, by the way, it was a, it was a gross yichus to be from the Pope's Jews. It meant you're going to live in peace as a Jew. What, was, what happened? The first time that Pope Pius complained, made a formal complaint against Hitler and the Nazis, is when the Italians were taken, all the Italian Jews were taken. I think there was, a, there was a movie, it was a fictional movie, but it reflected that, that one destiny for all Jews, the poor and rich alike, it was called the Garden of the Finci Cantinis. Arthur Cohn, you know, who he comes to Los Angeles fairly often, 
Arthur Cohn oversaw that, that project. Pope Pius complained because the Pope's Jews, the witness people as they're known, they were taken to Auschwitz along with the rest of the Italian Jews. That was the only time he, he had the formal complaint. You understand why the Jewish community right now, even though we have very good relations with John Paul, we, had very good, we have very, very good relations with Benedict, we have a lot of ambivalence and a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. Every time that they bring up, they should make Pope Pius a saint. If that was the only time that he, he made a formal protest, not to mention in you know, their defense as they were trying to stop communism, but it was because of the Catholic Church after 1945 that many, many Nazis, important Nazis, Nazis who had Jewish blood on their hands who were responsible for the extermination of thousands of Jews were given passage out of Europe with new identity papers and able to reestablish themselves in South America, in some cases in the United States and Canada. It was through the auspices of the church. Now, the church will respond that they had to do what they had to do. They needed these people's help in the battle against communism because to them, atheism was the worst of all evils. We, as the Jewish people, can't accept that answer. We can't live with that answer. We can't. It was our blood. It was our parents. It was our sisters. It was our grandparents, our uncles and aunts. It was our children's blood who these people were responsible for. And we can't live with that defense. But this is that theology. On the other hand, Ushma en kasenu, vikane kinasenu, vhaer panech al mikdash kahash amen. Go back about six, seven stanzas. Hate Elohai Oznicha, God, incline your ear, please hear our prayer. Hear the following, Yaharu. You know what Yuhara is from the Gemara? Yuhara is arrogance, the brazen arrogance of who? This is referring to the Moabites and the Ammonites, the Moabim and Ammonim. Kruven When they pillaged the Beis Amikdash, the, the Babylonians, the Moabites who were, lived in today's Jordan, what did they do? They took out the Kruvim and they said, oh, these Jews claim to be monotheists. Look at what they have in their Holy of Holies. Look what they have hiding. They're as pagan as the rest of us. They're as polytheistic as the rest of us. They knew full well we didn't worship the Kruvim. The Kruvim are what? It's the whole notion of these baby angelic faces when the Jewish people are, are one, when we're unified with each other and when we're unified in our relationship with God, they faced each other. It was a sign of what? Of the Jewish people living up to the role of a man to be almost angel-like, to be innocent like a child in, 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 our, in our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. It was a sign of that. But they twisted it and perverted it and made us into pagans, which we were not, of course. That's what we talked about in the previous kina, and not, I'm sorry, in Tezayin, about what Titus did in the Holy of Holies. Okay. Let's now skip to 21, Chaf Aleph. This, of course, is Arzli Halavan on the Ten Martyrs. This is very important, what we're going to say now. The Ten Martyrs are discussed twice a year. Musaf of Yom Kippur, in a much more elongated form, Ela Eskara, and Antishabav in a much shorter form, Arz Elavanon. Antishab and Yom Kippur, what, the reason we discuss this is because, to quote the Gemara in Yud Ches in Rosh Hashanah, Misis Tzadikim is Mechaperes. There's, there's a Kapara component to the death of the righteous. That does not mean the following. I want to make something very clear. Don't confuse that with Christian theology. Where I grew up, a little town, a farm town, 50 miles outside of Buffalo, you'd have at the entrance to the town, the town was basically two bars, uh, a general store, a post office. That was the town. But in, in a gas station, I apologize, a gas station as well. It would, the Methodist church had a huge sign didn't say it in these terminology, but the carpenter of Nazareth died for our sins. Then when you left town, there was a second huge billboard. The carpenter of Nazareth died for our sins. That is a very different theology than what we're saying on Yom Kippur of Mises Tzadikim Mecha Paris. You're responsible for your own sins. It's basic Judaism. The Torah says, the Bible says it clearly, Ish becheto yumaso, a person dies for their own sins, not for someone else's sins. A human being is responsible to God, we're responsible to ourselves for our own actions. What's the point? 
The point of Mises Tzadikim Mechaper is this, that when we lose a great, righteous, pious person, and we appreciate the gulf, the vacuum, the state of deprivation, that we no longer have this living Sefer Torah, this living role model to teach us, it forces us to strengthen ourselves, to fill the void. You look at, since the death of Rav Aaron Cutler's Zatzal, or of Moshe Feinstein's Zatzal, Rabbi Soloveitchik's Zatzal, for that matter, of Yaakov Kamenetsky. Look at the Torah that's been published by their Talmidim. You know, you know the, the, the millions of hours of Torah that have been learned, of the, probably 60, 70 different volumes, maybe more, of serious Torah. Some of the volumes that have been published in the Rav's name is not very serious. It's not quality Torah. But, but much of it is. Because the, the Talmudim wanted his Torah to continue, his principles that he taught us. And that's true of Rav Moshe, and that's true of Rav Aaron Cutler, and that's true of the Emes Lyakov, of Yaakov Kamenetsky. And that we, we, we look at them as a role model, and we try to live up to the lifestyle that they led, and we use them as, a, as an example for us. That's Mises Tzadikim Mechaper. So when we study and we learn about the lives of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Hanina ben Tarajon, that under the, the horrific Hadrianic decrees that I'll talk about in a minute, when Judaism would have been lost, they were most nefesh, they gave them their lives, that the theology should continue, that our value system should continue. And we commit ourselves to the transmission of that value system. That's Mises Tzadik and Mechaper. That's not what we're doing on Tisha B'Av. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah that I was alluding to on Yud Ches, Gidola Mises Tzadikim, Kisrefas Beis Elokeinu. Great is the death of the righteous like the burning of the Beis HaMikdash. What are they called? Arze HaLevanon. These are the cedars of Lebanon. These are the foundations of the Beis HaMikdash. These tzaddikim. Now, I want to tell you something. The story of the ten martyrs, their death is true. But the story as it's conveyed in Ela Eskar is a fictitious. It's a fictional medrash. The, own, the first two, the Kohen Gadol Rabbi Yishmael and the Nasi, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, they were killed prior to Chorban Bayashani. Sometime around 68, 69, they were executed by the Romans. The other eight were executed post Bar Kokhba. That means in the late 130s, possibly even the early 140s. The only one who lived in both lifetimes is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was alive when the first two were killed, and he was alive you know, when, when the time of the execution of the latter eight. But this didn't happen. It's not like they were convened together. It's a fictitious medrash. In fact, some people don't actually say Ela Eskar on Yom Kippur. There's certain who have the minog not to say it because Aser Lomar Shkarim Lichnei Amakum. You're not allowed to say falsehoods before God in, in a tefillah fashion. I'm not talking about for the purpose of limud. What's the point of the medrash? The point of the medrash is this. What was the corruption? What was the flaw of the generation of, of the Chorban Bayesheni in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba generation. Sin Aschinam. It's our flaw. Sin Aschinam. Intra-Jewish animosity. Intra-Jewish hatred. And what's the point? We go back to the greatest flaw that has, effect, has affected the Jewish people. That is intra-Jewish animosity. It starts with the brothers. It starts with the Shifteka, with the selling of Joseph. That's the point of the Medrash. And who's responsible for the generation? The leadership is. We saw by Yoshiao HaMelech. He was responsible for his generation. The leadership of the generation is responsible, even though they themselves are pious. But bottom line is that's what it means to be a leader. It means you carry the weight on your shoulders of the generation. And that's the idea of the ten for the ten. The, the flaw, the corruption of sinas chinam, of intra-Jewish animosity, is something that unfortunately is still alive and well. It led to Chorban Bayesheni, and we quoted the Yerushalmi Yuma that any generation which the temple is not rebuilt, it's a function that that generation is guilty of the flaws that led to its destruction. Here we mourn them because the loss of the righteous to us is the loss of every righteous who is killed, Al Kiddush Hashem, is the loss of a base of Mikdash. Now, one point that has to be made, we're going to discuss this now, and then the next kinna we're going to read is Chav Gimel, is the following. The Rambam in Hilchus Avel, in the Mishnah Torah in Hilchus Avel, Perak Yud Gimel, the Rav used to quote this. The Rambam says the following, that someone who doesn't mourn for a loved one is an achsar, it's, it's cruel. 
Bekol hamisabel yoser midai. Anyone who mourns excessively, harezet tipesh. That's foolish. What does that mean? Why, why is it foolish to mourn excessively? Because the Rambam says it's minhago olam. It's the nature of the universe. We were all born to die. Whether we live 20 years, 60 years, or 80 years, we were born, by definition, with a finite existence, a limited, frail, finite existence. That being the case, okay, that being the case, there is a time to cry, and there's a time to weep, and there's a time for depression, and then there's a life cycle, and there's a time for moving forward and moving on, and to turn the sadness and the pain into a legacy, a destiny, into continuing that legacy. That's all true of a regular. That's true of a regular Avelos. However, however, the Rav wanted to say, it's not Min Hagosha Olam that Rabbi Hanina ben Taradun was wrapped in a Sefer Torah and burnt to death. That Rabbi Akiva is a man ab- way over 100 years old, was taken out in the middle of the, of the Colosseum. You can go to it, you go to Kesari, you can see where he was butchered and executed. It's been restored. And, and he was, the iron cones that they took and they flayed his flesh, not just his skin, but his flesh. And that what happened to Rabbi, Rabbi Chutzpitz, the Maturgaman, etc., etc. That's not Min Shalom. That's not the nature of the world. That someone is butchered and slaughtered because they stand for God's system, because they stand for an ethical system, because they stand for our theological, our philosophical principles. They should be executed and slaughtered in the way we've described all morning. It's not Min Olam. The Rav says for that, there is no such thing as being Miss Abel Yoser Midai. That's why each and every year we are back in mourning. Each and every year we relive the funeral, which is what we're experiencing now. There's no Miss Abel Yoser Midai. And that's why we tear Korea. That's why we sit on the low stools. That's why we're sitting here. We don't give Shalom Aleichem. We're back again in Avelos. We're reliving it. We're going to say in Kina Yud Aleph, B'tseisi Yerushalayim, just like there's a mitzvah, B'chol dor v'dor chay of Adam liros is asmo, k'ilu hu yatsa mi mitzrayim, that we relive the experience, Seder night. We relive our emancipation. We're being emancipated. It's not just avoseinu. Lanu, it says. Asher alanu. We are being redeemed, Seder night. The same thing is true this morning. The same thing is true this morning. We are experiencing Churban Yerushalayim. We are experiencing the Churban of Chimonitsky, of the Shoah, of the Auto de Fe, of the Inquisition, etc., of the pogroms, of the terrorist activities that have taken place in our lifetime in Israel. David Applebaum. We brought him here. He was working with Sinai Hospital, Cedar Sinai, and with UCLA, helping them upgrade their, their whole emergency system, learning from the way they dealt with it. We sat at the porch of one of our members. He gave us a shear. We were going to bring him as a scholar in residence to Beth Jacob. And then the night before his daughter Nava's wedding, he takes out his daughter to the Hillel Cafe. They have a cup of coffee. A father and daughter, the night before, she goes off to what will be the rest of her life independent, away from mom and dad. And what happened? The next day, there was no wedding. The next day, the ring that would have been put on her finger was put by her coffin. And she was laid to rest next to her father. This, you don't say, call her Miss Abel, Yoser Midai, Hareza Tipish. No. Because this is not Min Hago Shal Ola. And that's what we're doing when we say Arze Halavanon, and we're going to do the next kina of Benu Bas Rabbi Ishmael. Chafal of Arze Halavanon. These were the cedars of Lebanon. These are the real base of Mikdash Adirei Torah. Bale Trisim B'Mishnu V'Gemara. Gibore Koach Amalea Betara. Their struggle, their toil in understanding Judaism and teaching it to us was done Betara. These people were so pure. Their personalities were so refined. Damam nishbach hamayim, their blood was spilled like water, the nashasa gvura. Hinam kedoshe harugim alchos asar, the ten that were executed by the Roman government. Al eile, over these, ani bochi, I cry, eni nigra. I cannot hold back the tears. Zos bezachri ezak, zaaka gedolo mara, describing Mordechai. I cry out, I can't stop crying. 
Chemdas Yisrael, Klei HaKodesh, Nezer Ve'atara. They are, what does it mean, the Klei HaKodesh? The Kalim and the Beis HaMikdash, they have, they have what's called Kedushas HaGuf. They're sanctified with Kedushas HaGuf. These people were not just ordinary people. They transformed their personalities that they were holy vessels. They were our crown and glory, Nezer Ve'atara, Tahore Leiv, Kodshe Kadashim. These were the Holy of Holies. Shechitasim B'misa Chamura. They were the sacrifice to God, a sacrifice to God on behalf of the Jewish people. The first two, Yadu Goral, Mi Rishon Lechereb Berura. Neither want, both wanted to die first. The Kohen Gadol didn't want to see the execution of the, Navi, the Nasi, and Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, the Nasi, didn't want to see the execution of the Kohen Gadol, Rabbi Yishmael. So, Kinfol Goral, Rabbi Shimon, Pasha Tzavaro Bacha, Kenigzagur Gzera. He extended himself. Why, why did he cry? He didn't cry because he was afraid of dying. There's a medrash in Parshas Mishpatim that describes he was crying over that maybe as a Nussi, when there were long lines, there was a widow. You know, and she had to stand outside and she had to wait her turn. And she thought the reason that she's having to wait for hours to see this great scholar is because she's a nobody. She's not wealthy, she's not important, she doesn't have power. The reason why is because it was just everybody was waiting their turn. But she suffered as a function of her plight, thinking that he didn't acknowledge or recognize her or appreciate her. And that nebuch caused sorrow and tragedy and tears to a widow, to an orphan. And when he thought about that, it, maybe that's why he was suffering, because of not taking the precautions to provide for those widows and orphans as the leader of the people, that they should never have that sense, that sense of hopelessness of despair. So the descendant of Aaron, of course, Rabbi Yishmael, he was crying over. He took, the, the, he took the, the, literally they decapitated Rabbi Shimon, and he took the skull, he took the skull and he placed it on his lap and he cried over this great. And he says, Some may know that put his eyes and eyes. Pival Pibava Gemura Anava Amar. He declared, Pe Hamis Gaber Batora. This mouth that has so communicated so many beautiful ideas has inspired so many and taught so many. Peace something like that. And like just in a second, it's gone. Niknasalav Misa Mishuna Chamura. It's a whole question how could he as a Kohen? have been metame himself by holding the corpse. It could be he was already tame, they were in the same ohel. It could be by a nasi, there's, there's a halacha that by the nasi, everyone is mechuyiv to, to be. It's, it, the nasi is treated as a mes mitzvah. That's the way Rav, one time when the Rav was learning this, he felt that could be the reason why as a kohen, he, he grabbed the skull. So tziva lahafshi des rosho hamelech besar ha what happened? The daughter of the Roman proconsul. Was, he was so good-looking, Rabbi Yishmael. He was so handsome. She asked if he could peel off the skin of his face and put it on a bust. And he could have a bust that she could look at of this gorgeous Jewish man. So these sick animals, this is what they did. So they started to peel away the skin of his face. Only when he came to the point of the tefillin where he would be, have the mitzvah of putting the tefillin on his forehead, mitzvah bara, then shima tza'aka, Olam. From that cry, from that bellow, it's as if the earth trembled. Eretz his parara. Tamod zechus his, his slush should be for the generations. Kol Adonai bahadara. Me'acharav, now we're skipping about 65 years. We're going to the Hadrianic decrees. Just very, very one important note you have to understand before we get to this point. After the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Romans, just, they just gave up their hands. It took them... They just, they just slaughtered a half a million Jews. Most of the people killed were not the soldiers. They weren't Bar Kokhba soldiers. They were men, women, and children. That half a million Jews was... The only comparison in history was the Holocaust because that half a million Jews was probably a third of world Jewry that was executed. And you know the story. They were not even allowed to be buried. So there were a number of apostate Jews. Elisha ben Avuya is one of them. This is based... The Rav explained this based on the Yerushalmi. And they said to the Romans, you've got to learn from the Greeks. The only way, you, you'll never stop the Jews. When it says, am kshayor, if they were a stiff-necked people, it's not just stiff-necked to the Ribbon Sholem, we're stiff-necked to, to everyone, especially to you, the Romans, who are trying to defeat us. The only way you're going to stop the Jews is stop Jewish education, stop Torah education. And at that point, based upon the help 
in the assistance of a number of these apostate Jews. I don't, want to, I don't even know if I want to call them apostate Jews, but they were Jews who ratted out. They were Mosrim. They ratted out the theology. They instituted the Hadrianic decrees. The major, two, the two major Hadrianic decrees, and there were others, was they prohibited Torah education, no Jewish education, public education. Number two is the transmission of Jewish religious leadership, of the smicha, the transmission of the smicha. What happened was, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Hanina ben Taradio, and others, they defied, and you're familiar with the Gemara in Masech de Brachos in the ninth parak. They defied these decrees for a very simple reason. They said that will be the end of the Jewish people. If we teach Torah, we may be killed, we may be executed, but there's a chance the Jewish people and Jewish religion will survive. If the Jewish religion doesn't survive, there will be no Jewish people. We are only, Ein umasenu, to quote Sadia Gon, the great Rav Sadia Gon, Ein umasenu uma ela bishvil ha Torah. We are who we are only as a function of the Torah. And what happened? It backfired on the Romans. Yes, they executed Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Hanina ben Taradio, and Rabbi Lazar ben Shemuel. You'll, we'll read about them in just a moment. But what happened was they became the poster children. They became the flag bearer of the Jewish people. Instead of the Jews being afraid of the Romans, they took the example and they said, we can't allow Rabbi Akiva's death. That's the idea of Misa Tzadikim Mechaper. We can't allow his death to be for naught. We've got to continue his legacy. We've got to continue his mission. Judaism has to survive. And after Rabbi Akiva had lost, in the, the context of the Bar Kokhba revolt, had lost 24,000 students, even though the Gemara that we have says they died of Askara, Rabbi Soloveitchik said Askara, which means diphtheria, is Lashen Saginar. It's a euphemistic term. It means they were executed during the Bar Kokhba rebellion by the Roman legions. Romans prohibited any records. It was like the Nazis. They prohibited any records to be written of these things. When the revolt took place at Treblinka, they plowed it over like it never existed. The same thing at Belgium. the same thing at Sobibor. God forbid the world should know what the Nazis did at Sobibor, Treblinka, and Belgium. That's exactly what happened with the Romans after Bar Kokhba. It's not like what happened with the Roman War. That they were proud of. That they had a historian, the Wars of the Jews, Josephus Labius. That they were very proud of, because that was war. Heinous crimes against humanity, they weren't proud of that. And they wouldn't allow a record of it. And then they started with the Hadrianic Decrees to finally snuff out Judaism. What happened? You know what happened? It backfired. Rabbi Akiva became the rallying call of Am Yisrael. And through his students, Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Yehuda, the, the, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi, Rabbi Meir, the greatest of his students, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, through his students, Rabbi Yossi, those five students, he was an old man. He was a man probably in his late 90s and his hundreds when he taught them. But Judaism survived. And through their students, like Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the Torah survived. Once the Torah survived, the Jewish people survived. So it backfired. Rabbi Zakiva's death was not for naught. In the aftermath of Rabbi Kiva's death, the Jewish people, we didn't know that we would. We weren't sure whether we would survive. But we came back. He, he would literally uproot mountains in terms of his analysis, his linear analytical ability. He was a brilliant mind. Esbisoro Misarkin, they didn't just comb his flesh, his skin, it was his flesh that they, with the iron combs, Bemasrik Habarzal Hishtabra. And by the way, it wasn't just once. Multiple times, every day they would take him out and they would gather crowds in Caesarea. You had all kinds of people traveling back and forth to Rome. They would watch as the old Jew would be, would be scraped with the iron comb. Yotzeson Nishmaso Be'echad, until finally one day, saying the Shema, he died. Ubas kol amra, the heavenly voice said, Rabbi Akiva Ashrecha, fortunate are you. Gufcha tahor bechol tahara. You are not just a great scholar. You're not just a righteous person. But your very body has been transformed into an object of tahara. Ben Bava Rabbi Yehuda. We, you can go, by the way, to Rabbi Yehuda Ben Bava's grave. It was just, unfortunately, what do they call that when they, 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 they violate the grave? They put spray paint on What do they call that? Demar 
they desecrated the Arabs in the Galilee. The Israeli Arabs desecrated his grave a couple of years ago. It's now been fixed up again and reestablished the Matseva. Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava, was, there was a decree, the Gemara in the first paragraph of Sanhedrin says, that any person who gives smicha, he'll be executed because that's the continuity of the Jewish religion. That's the continuity of Jewish leadership. He'll be executed, and those who get the smicha will be executed. Not only that, we'll destroy, we'll literally burn down and destroy the town that it takes place. So he went into a few empty mountains in the Galilee, and he gave smicha. Obviously, some Jew ratted him out to the Roman authorities, and they came. He was 70 years old at the time. He was a weak 70. You know, today, 70 is a spring chicken. At that time, 70 was, was an older person, and he couldn't flee. And the students didn't want to leave him. He says, the whole reason I came to give you smicha is that Judaism should survive. You have to flee. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Nechemia, and they fled, and he was executed. Ben Bava, Rabbi Yehuda, Acha, Rav Heviu, B'Shivron, Leva, Azhara, Nerag, Ben Shivim, Shana. He was executed at 70, Bidei Risha, Arura. Yoshe, Betanis, Haya. He was a pious person. He would sit every day and fast. Naki, he was extremely honest. Chasid, everything he did, he went above and beyond the letter of the law. B'Malach, the Lamara. Chanani ben Teradio Nachra of Makil Kilos Pitzion Shara. What he would gather in defiance of the Hadrianic decrees, he would gather the crowds and teach them Torah. Yoshe Vidoresh, the Sefer Torah Imo. Because again, they used the Sefer Torah, it was a text. They didn't have books, they, they taught from the text of the Torah. Vihikifu Bechavle Mizmora, what did they do? They like literally, they made him into like, where I grew up on the farm, they would have like these pig barbecues. They would roast the whole pig and they would have hay and they would have wood and they would roast it. That's what they made him. They made him into a pig barbecue is they wrapped him in his, the, 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 the bundles of wood. And, and not only that, but they wrapped him in the Sefer Torah that he was teaching. And they burnt him alive. In their sickness, what did they do? They took these wet sponges of wool so that he would die a slow death. As he's being burnt to death, he should die a slow death. Shalom Yamus Mehera. Chassid Rabbi Yosheva of a sofer. Sofer doesn't mean here a scribe. Yes, it means it's someone who inscribed in the hearts of the people the, the values of the Torah. Haragu, that's why they call him Ezra HaSofer, right? Because they inscribe in the hearts of the people the values of Judaism. Haragu Amamora, Zraku Vishlihulakavim. They didn't even allow him to be buried. They, they threw him to the dogs, his dog meat. Velohukvar Bikfura. Kol bas yatsa alav shaloiniach klum mitaras moshe l'shamer. There was no part of the Torah that he didn't observe and understand. As Rabbi Chanina ben Chachinoi v'achrav Rabbi Chutzpitz b'yom evra miyad ofa pareich b'havon piv nisra b'kim ledura. You know the story of Rabbi Chutzpitz and Maturgaman. Many of the great Tanaim, they were the greatest minds, but they weren't necessarily the greatest orators. I'll give you an example. Rav Moshe Feinstein was the God of Ador, the Posei Kador. But if you, anyone who knows the shiurim that he gave, these brilliant Divros Moshe shiurim, they were not that well attended. It was a Friday morning, Lower East Side, MTJ. You sat in that shir, you wanted to vomit from the smell. Why? Because they allowed every nebuch and every shlamazel, they came in, they, the yeshiva gave them to drink, to food, but these people didn't shower. Like these, you know, they were psychologically, you know, a lot of the bums that we see on the street, it's because psychologically they can't get their act together. So they would allow these people to sit there. Rev Moshe is the Gadol Hador because he was the greatest posek. But it wasn't per se for his great oratory. Not that he wasn't an orator, but it wasn't for his great oratory skills. He did, the thousands didn't come to hear his shiurim. It was a case, and I'm using it as a contrast to the Rav. The Rav was not the posek Hador. He poskened. He poskened for his family, for himself, for some of his Talmidim. But he would send people to, to Rav Moshe. Rav Moshe was the posek Hador. But the Rav, on a Saturday night, before everybody got into learning, before the world was excited about learning in the 60s, you'd get 300, 400 people would come to the Maimonides Yeshiva. When the whole rest of the world was going to the movies in those days, they all came to listen to the Rav. The Rav for a Yortzeit Drosha would get thousands. There was 1,000 people in Lamport Auditorium, and there were another 300 people in the base Medrash on a hookup, on a screen. Because not only was he a great Gadol, he was a great orator as well. Many of the Tanayim were not the great orators. So they had a Maturgaman. They would teach the Torah. And what would happen? The Maturgaman would communicate it. He, the Maturgaman wasn't always the great Tana. He was a big Talmud Chacham. He had to understand the Shir. But he would communicate it in a way that the people could understand. This Rebbe Chutzpitz, a Maturgaman, he was not only a great scholar, he was. 
He was a great scholar, but he was a great orator. People would come from miles around just to hear his shear, just to be engaged, to be inspired, to be educated. And what did they do? They cut out his tongue and they threw it away before they killed him. That was the sickness of the Romans. Tzadik Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua ba'acharon ne'erag b'madkeira. Yom Erev Shabbos haya, zman kiddush v'yikadesh v'yikra. Cherev shalfu Allah v'lohi nichu b'chaim l'sayim l'olagamra yotzas ha'nishmasa b'var elohim yotzer v'tzar tzura. The minna that we have to say, v'yichul ha'shamayim v'aretz v'chol tzva'am, right, by kiddush, to, that we testify, that we are testifying that God created the universe. We're reenacting the whole experience of the Shabbos. That's an old, old minhag. The Talmud of Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, did that. They didn't even allow him to finish saying Kiddush. They executed him in the middle of saying, Vayichula Shamayim Va'aretz V'chol Tzva'am. Hine Kahena V'chahena. That's a quote from David HaMelech. What do I mean? Don't think it was just the eight that we've quoted. But it was like these and like those many, many others. Hosifu b'nei avla lanos begara, b'ski l'srefa herig v'chene. All different types of executions. Miu chalashara. We can't even we can't even describe it. We can't even fathom it. No seris mimena yochlu ariaros sevzur. The said the lamb, the Jewish people is like the lamb. We've been devoured by the lions. Yochlu ab b'makom kadosh kechatas ka'asham. These pious, they were the karbanos. They were our sacrifice to the Almighty, like a korban chatas, the Holy of Holies, kodshe kadashim, like a korban ashim, kodshe kadashim. Yitav bein Adonai v'leusif od liyasra, ametz birkayim koshlos chelik Yaakov Moshiach be'is sara letzedek imloch melech v'shalma yimei avleich l'orani savanelech. Because of time, we're going to go to chaf gimel. What you have to understand in chaf gimel is the following. There was a book that came out called The Seventh Million. We not only mourn the six million that were killed, but unlike many of the survivors that we know, who came, who rebuilt their life, created new families, built our day schools, built our shuls, built our mikvos, those survivors are the great story, who've rebuilt their lives, rebuilt their world. But let's be honest. There are many, many survivors. In fact, today we have statistics from the, from the claims conference, that one-third of the survivors in Israel are below the poverty line, and one-quarter of the survivors in America that are still alive are below the poverty line. These are people that are physically alive after Hitler, but they died. They never survived Auschwitz, even though physically they survived Auschwitz. They never survived the ghetto. They never survived the labor camps, Mauthausen. They led a life of depression. These were the people who for the last 50, 60 years have been living ghosts. They're the seventh million. And what about the survivors who did very well financially? But you know what? As a function of the horrors, they have dysfunctional personal lives, and dysfunctional family lives. And it goes on in their children. Because instead of the children hearing about bedtime stories, the bedtime stories that their children heard were about how my brother was a sweet little boy, how he was executed and murdered in front of me. And the bedtime stories, and about every time that their child, for instance, that this child is a survivor, got a boo-boo and was crying. Uh, you, you don't know. You, you know what Saris is? Let me tell you about Saris. There was a girl who I named you after, and she looked just like you, pretty like you, and you know what they did to her, and this is how they butchered her. That child of the survivor could never have a feeling, could never have a personality. Because after all, in light of my namesake, you know, nothing I do will ever be enough. So Hitler is alive and well, killing our people long after 1945, long after he and Eva Braun committed suicide. We have to mourn for those korbanos as well. And that's this story. The son and daughter of Rabbi Ishmael Kohen Gadol, they could have become, who knows, maybe that boy could have become the next Kohen Gadol. Maybe she would have been the family that would have raised, you know, members of the Sanhedrin. She would have married someone from the Sanhedrin. She would have been a role model to Jewish women across the world. Maybe not. Maybe they would have just re led regular lives. They weren't killed in the siege of Jerusalem. They weren't butchered or massacred. They were sold on a Roman slave market. But in the end, 
probably wasn't suicide. It was probably just dying of exhaustion and of, and of depression. And we know depression can lead to physical ramifications. In the end, they survived, but they didn't survive. They also were killed as a function of the Khorban. Their lives were not lives, and they were the living dead after the Khorban. And we mourn for them as well. You think it's any different in Israel today? What about these families, okay, that you know, we've long forgotten about because the news, you know, how, you know how news is today. You're in the news for, for, for a day, for two days. Unless it's the flotilla, then it gets two weeks. But everything else is the news cycle is a day or two days. Nebuch, these people, these people, they go on their, with their life as cripples. They go on their life, you know, waking up, screaming in the night, yelling because of, they're reliving the bombing incident or they're reliving how their mother was killed in front of their own eyes. What about these people? You think they're going to lead a normal life? You don't think they have ghosts that haunt them? That they're not paranoid? That they're not frail? That they don't look at the world through optimistic lenses? That's what this kina is for. It's Navi. My temple, Chatasi Hishmima, destroyed it. Vidimasi, and because of that, again, I continue, my tears continue to stroll down my cheeks. Halecha yi azrima. Uvi yom zeh, this day tishabav, nehi nehi avarima. I will not stop crying. I will go back again and again and relive the avelis. Vahima miyamim yamima. Each and every year, miyamim yamima. Eva lei v'nichum chadal chadol. You can't stop me. You can't, con- you can't console me. There is no nechama. When I even think of them, their memory, it burns in my heart. Each and every year I go back and mourn them. They were abducted and they were taken like everyone, like the other captives, out the Jaffa gate to the Jaffa port, shipped across the Mediterranean. And they were bought by two members of the Roman aristocracy. It turned out these two guys that bought them were, were neighbors. They were bragging to each other. You know, from the Zionist slaves, oh, you wouldn't believe it. I got this beautiful looking girl that I've got as a shivcha. She radiates, she's so pretty. Remember how we described how handsome her father was? She's so pretty, she radiates like the moon. Ketzia and Yamima were the children, the daughters of Eov that are described as these most gorgeous, stunning people. That's what she looks like. So his friend, he bragged double. You know what I bought off the market of the Jerusalem group, the group of slaves brought in from Jerusalem? You think she was beautiful? This guy is so handsome, it's like his, he radiates like the sun at high noon. Bone is of game. I told you we're in the cattle business. My family were German Jewish refugees who were in the farming business. So part of the science of producing good animals for sale, for milk, depending on what we're going to do with them, is the whole science of breeding. Which bull with which cow, which semen we're going to use to get more uh, higher protein, which semen we're going to use to get a higher fat content, which semen we're going to use so that they'll have a stronger back so she can have good weight and, and put on weight and produce more milk. You're talking about animals. The science of breeding is something you do with animals, not, God forbid, with human beings. But the son and daughter of the Kohen Gadol, these righteous young kids, young adolescents, they're treated as like animals. Let's breed them. Bo nizav game. V'nechalka bin You know what we'll do? We'll, we'll divide up the children. You know, you'll get the first child, I'll get the second, and so we'll have more like this, and we can, we can go into the whole breeding business. When I even hear them talking this, my ears ring. Even to, to think about this, to recall this, I will tear, I will tear Korea. Afrima is tearing Korea again. As the Rav said, we go back and, and we're in Avelis each and every year. As the two of them agreed upon this, they put them in a room. And remember, they didn't have electricity, there were no lights at that point. 
The masters were waiting outside. Libam ke'echad. Vehim bochim bemar nefesh v'pachad. The two of them are crying there. Ad boker bechiyasam lohit mima. Literally, each of them is like in a corner of the room crying, not approaching the other. Vahima miyamim yamima. Ze yispod. What did the son do? Bikod levav. His heart is burning inside of him. Nin aron eich leshivcha yihi nosei. How can the grandson of Aaron end up marrying a shivcha? Vihi gam hi tiyalel besigra shosei. Bas yocheved eich leeved tinosei. How can the scion of, of Yocheved, the matriarch of Shevet Levi of the Kohanim, end up marrying an Eved? Oi kizos gazar omer vaosei. This is not the life they had hoped for each other. I mean, I've got to give you an example. We had a man in, in our con congregation in, in Michigan. He was raised into a family. They were in the foresting business. You know, they would cut down trees in Poland, and they would turn it into lumber. They were, you know, and they were very, very wealthy people. And it was a Hasidic family. He was going to be raised to be a Talmud Chacham. He would have his own base medrash. They would put him in the yeshiva. He would, and he loved it. He was learning as a young kid. And he was, you know, the, the family could, could, so to speak, give their miser in the sense that they would have one child who would be a marbitz Torah, who would be a rebbe for Klal Yisrael. And you know what happened? The churban came. And he wasn't prepared to be sent to the camps. He had a job the rest of his life as a painter. He married another survivor, another Polish survivor. He lived, he tried, he never made it financially. He always would talk about his childhood. He lived, he lived to maybe his late 70s, early 80s. But his life stopped. It stopped in 1940 when he was taken away. Always Nebuch, a Nebuch would sit towards the back of the shul. He was a nice man. He was a good man. And in the end, his kids, his kids really did great things. And he was so proud of his kids. But he lived through his kids. Because his life was over. His life stopped. And you know how many survivors, that's their story? That's what happened. In their wildest nightmare, this young man and this young woman could have never imagined that was going to happen to them. These were Nikiye Hadash, Shebirushalayim, the son and daughter of the Kohen Gadol. They were going to live for Klal Yisrael. They were responsible for Klal Yisrael. And this is what happened to them. Or Boker, Zehikiru, the light of the morning came. They started to recognize each other. Hoyachi, it's my brother. Oh my God. Hoyachos, it's my sister. Ikbiru. Venishabchu Yacha, Venishabaru. They embraced each other. They never knew if they'd ever see each other. But they died literally. They died just of, of depression. Never to get married. Never to have children. Never to build a, build a Jewish people. Never to spend a life of learning in mitzvahs and mass and tovim and chesed and doing good for others. Again, consistently, I can't get over this. I can't stop crying, he says. And in my heart, We're going to turn to Chaf Hay, to 25. We're just going to do a few highlights of 25. You know... Minag Ashkenaz, and unless you have a simcha at the end of the Sphira period, where Rav Moshe gives a special allowance to observe the first part of the Sphira period, if you're an Ashkenazi, you really should be observing the second half of the Sphira. That is Minag Ashkenaz, the Ramah records it. The Taz explains to us why. The Misora of the Torah took place in Germany. After the diminishment of the great Babylonian communities, Sura and Pumpadisa along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the great, the great yeshivas, I'm sorry, along the Euphrates, and the Jewish world moved. In one movement, it moved towards North Africa, eventually into Spain with the Moors. They came across the Iberian Peninsula. 
those of you who saw the movie Robin Hood with um, Kevin Costner and, and, and Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman was one of these Moor Muslims. He's one of the Moors that brought, they brought them in from North Africa, from Morocco into, into Andalusia, into southern Spain. And you had this community known as Svarad, Spanish Jewry. The other group came through Italy, Bari and Rome and other places, and eventually made it its way into the German Rhineland. But it was that group in the German Rhineland where the Masorah of Torah, the whole Masorah that came from the yeshivas in Bavel, Surah and Pumpadisa, from, from the Gaonim, Rav Haigon, is now literally on the shoulders of the great scholars in the yeshiva of Mainz. The greatest of them all is Rabbeinu Gershom Moor HaGaola, the one who enlightened the diaspora, Rabbeinu Gershom Moor HaGaola. And through his students, Rabbi Yaakov Ben Yakar, Rabbi Yitzhak Halevi, Sigon, the Masorah continued. Jews from all over the world came to the yeshiva in Mainz and then the offshoot of the yeshiva in Worms. The German Rhineland was it. It was the heart and soul of the Torah of the world. Keep in mind, Rashi, who never met Rabbeinu, I'm sorry, Rabbeinu Meir Gor, Moor Hagola, let me say that again, Rabbeinu Gershom Moor Hagola, he never met him, but he was a student of some of his greatest students. He was part of that Masora. Like other French young men, brilliant French young men, their families and their communities sent them from northern France. Rashi grew up in a town called Troyes, and they were sent to mines and to worms to learn and study. Rashi, and you'll see why am I talking about Rashi, he did something unique. The, fa the family, the community brought him back to be their rabbi. Now you have to understand, that doesn't happen too often. The same little kid who's tying up people's tzitzis on Simchas Torah, the same little kid who was running around in diapers, that's not usually the kid you're going to take and make him as your rabbi in 30 years from now, 25 years, because in your mind, he's that little kid. They did that with Rashi. Our religion, our Masorah was saved because they did that. Because what happened? Rashi, through his students, the Machzer Vitri, Rabbeinu Simcha, through his sons-in-law, who produced his grandsons, his daughters and sons-in-law were all scholars, who produced Rabbeinu Tam, produced... Rashbam of Shmuel ben Meir, the Rivon, etc. The great grandson, the Ri of Dampir, Rabbi Yitzchak. Because Rashi started a school, uh, not only a school like a yeshiva, I'm talking about because he had students that studied and learned with him in France, northern France started to become a place of serious Jewish learning and serious scholarship. Now, what happened was in 1096, and I'm not going to go into the history of the Crusades. But the great fear was what would happen in France. Godfrey of Bouillon started the La Croix, the crusade. We're going to go to Palestine. We're going to go to the Holy Land, and we're going to emancipate it of the infidels, and we're going to make it, put it back under Christian control like it was under the years of Byzantium. And the German Jews gave tzedakah. They davened. They said to Hillam for the French Jews, because they were concerned for their French brothers. But they felt very comfortable. Well, just the opposite happened. Because in Germany, there was something known as the People's Crusade. Instead of going towards the Holy Land, they went up the Rhine River. And as they went up the Rhine River, the great three German communities of Schum, Schum is an acronym, Speyers, or the word Shapiro comes from Spires. If your name is Shapiro, it means you descend from people who came from there. Spires, the Vav is Vermeisa, worms, the Mem of Shum is Magensia, mines. Spires, worms, mines. We're going to read what happened to them. They're decimated and annihilated. In the case of Spires, not as much because the bishop actually protected many of the Jews. It was only those outside the bishop's protection that died. It wasn't the case in worms and mines. But it wasn't just those three cities. There's many other cities as well. In France, it was very uncomfortable. But the slaughter, but the butchering and the murdering of innocent Jewish men, women, and children didn't take place. Germany was annihilated. It was decimated. It wasn't just these communities. It was Regensburg. It was other communities. Rothenburg, other, many other communities. And the Messiah would have been lost had it not been for the fact that Rashi, through his sons-in-law and daughters, his grandsons, France became the Makam HaTorah. 
see, Rashi's commentary is not Rashi. We call it Rashi. We, the moderns, call it Rashi. What did they call it? They called it the Kuntras, the notes. Perish or Kuntras, explanation of the notes. Why? That was the notes of the, how to understand the Gemara going all the way back to the Gonim, the way that it was taught by Rabbeinu Gershom Mar Hagola, the way that it was learned in Minds and Worms. And because of that commentary of Rashi, we actually have it. Where we don't have a Rashi, we've lost that whole Masora. Masech the Nazir. Masech the Nidarim. We don't have it. We've, we're lost in those Masechtas. With the First Crusade, which happened in May and June, in ER and Sivan of 1096, Tatnu, Tach is 1648, 1649, Tatnu is 1096, the Minog and Ashkenaz became to observe Svira from Rosh Chodesh Iyar, those 33 days, Rosh Chodesh Iyar, until the Shlosh Hashemayak Bala. Why? Because what is the Svira Saomer all about? What is Svira all about? It's the loss of the Masorah, the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. Judaism was almost lost. Had it not been for superhuman efforts of Rebbe Akiva as an old man with the five Talmidim, and had it not been for providence, Judaism would have been lost as a religion. The Bali and Masora were wiped out. It was only because Rebbe Akiva could teach these five students that Judaism survived. Rebbe Meir, Rebbe Shimon, Rebbe Yehuda, Rebbe Yossi, Rebbe Elizabeth ben Shemua. The exact same thing happened in the spring of 1096. Those of you who are familiar with Avarachimim, Avarachimim, if you, the, the, the institution of Avarachimim, and if you go to a German shul that follows through Minagashkenaz, it's only said twice a year. The Shabbos before Shavuos and the Shabbos before Tisha B'av. We mourn their loss. We don't have a kina, unfortunately, for the loss of all the German Jews who were killed in the aftermath of the bubonic plague of the Black Death, which put an end to the glory of Ashkenaz, because Ashkenaz rebuilt itself under of Mayor of Rothenburg for a short period of time. It rebuilt itself. But after the aftermath of the bubonic plague, the Black Death, essentially it all moved either to Poland or it moved to uh, Spain. That's why there's so many Sephardic Jews with the last name Ashkenazi or Tsefati. This crusade, and, and I'm looking at the time, we don't have time to go into it, but this afternoon when you go home with your Kinos books, if you haven't bought, it's very crucial to have as part of your library, not because I work for the OU, but because of its great depth. Rabbi Soloveitchik, for 13 years, taught Kinos at Maimonides Yeshiva in Boston, and the notes of that are in this Sefer, the, the Rabbi Soloveitchik Kinos, the Kinos Mesaras Harav, produced by OU and Koran. And it's important to have that, to understand that. It describes the destruction of spires, worms, and mines. And in the Kina, the Rishon, it was one of the Colonimus family who wrote this, he says the following. I apologize, give me a second. At the end of, towards the end of the Kina. Tachas <laughs> kein hayom livyasi aura ve'espedave lila. The Efke Benefesh Mara. They were thinking, the Chachme Ashkenaz, after the Crusade, of setting up a special fast day, a day of mourning of the destruction of German Jewry, of the Misora, of the loss of Ashkenaz. And they decided not to do it. The Chi'ain Lahosif, you don't add a period of Shever Vesavera. Tachas Kain, Hayom Livyasi Aura. When Menachem Begin came to Rabbi Salavechik, one of the, they had a very close relationship because the Rav's grandfather, Rav Chaim, was the head of Brisk, was the rabbi of Brisk, and Menachem Begin's father was the gabbai of Brisk. The, very, the families had a very close relationship. The one time the gabbai didn't listen, you, you, gabbai didn't just mean like the gabbai of this minion. I mean, he was like the, the parnas. He oversaw what happened. They had one argument where they didn't listen to the rabbi, and you, you know amongst the Jewish people we have a long line, a long tradition of not listening to the rabbi. Reb Chaim did not want them having an askara for Theodore Herzl in Brisk in the shul. And Menachem Begin's father did it against the rabbi's command and against the rabbi's wishes, and they had an askara in the main shul for Theodore Herzl, for the shloshim. But they had a long-standing relationship, the, the Begins and the Soloveitchiks. And, and Rabbi Soloveitchik convinced Menachem Begin that Yom HaShoah is Tisha B'av. 
You can't have a Yom HaShoah where all it is is about destruction and calamity. Theologically, it doesn't allow for tshuva. It doesn't allow for introspection. It doesn't allow for proper theological mourning. And Menachem Begin went back to Israel with every intention of moving Yom HaShoah because Yom HaShoah, the date was a whimsical date. They originally wanted to, to commemorate the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but they couldn't have Yom HaShoah on Pesach, so they moved it to the week after Pesach. It didn't have any theological basis. It was something done by the Knesset with, unfortunately, a lack of sensitivity to, to, to the Jewish religion and the Jewish calendar. And Menachem Begin was going to switch it. He didn't in the end because the educator said, we can't have Yom HaShoah during the summer. We need to have it during the school year. We have to have it during the school year so that the Israeli school children can appreciate the Shoah and can study and can learn and can experience it. So for that reason, he didn't move it. But the Rav quoted this kinna from, from Rav Kolonimus to Menachem Begin as to why we as religious Jews, our Yom HaShoah is observed on Tisha B'av. Because all destruction all calamity, even the greatest of all calamities, which by far the Shoah was, is always observed in the context, in the context of Silu Kashchina. What is the Chorban? What is Chorban Beis HaMikdash? It's Silu Kashchina. Is it, is it 12.25? Yeah. What we're, we're going to do is we're going to skip um, a number of the kinos that we were going to be learning. And we're going to go to the kinos for the Chorban. After that, we're going to be saying Elitzion. Do we have a volunteer that may want to? No, okay. What we're going to turn is, if you could first turn to the, the kina of Rav Schwab. Now, I have the Rabbi Salavechi kina. It's in the Art Scroll kina as well. So if you can share with someone who either has one of those two kinos, you'll find that. Page 621 in the Kinnah. Mm-hmm. Goel Adam no Zecher Tsaram Altin Chemi Sefer Kasafta. Sukhor na Kos Virasha Tsakos. Shagos Mikahal Hanechan Akim Toch Toe Haidin, the Sirchon Gufos Gvios Fugus Gufos Gelal Domen Admas Nordsin, Ech Hot Hutor Fehem Lavoris Halvehem or Ish Liki Shute Hanashim, who creates us its both shall rush a pros, the mean she would perish some of us as more. Se samim lola dam bene gola hoya real mini vlas hasidere son kadashimi yim ne, asher isham losif ke bechunecha hayum kache shemecha, bekol shema yisrael masu, nashishla el yuas fein vod yomachun. Or hadash tazria, carne hold tazmir for him near a chefes. If I could ask Rabbi Schwartzman to come lead us, we're going to be saying the 31st Kina. We said that today we are reliving the exodus of Yerushalayim. We're reliving all of the Churbanos. Kina Lamed Aleph, which contrasts the experience of leaving Mitzrayim, Bitsesimi Mitzrayim, with the experience of Bitsesimi Yerushalayim. We have a minute here in Shari Tzedek to sing this. We sing the first line of each stanza out loud, and the second line, which contrasting the leaving of Mitzrayim with the 
leaving Yerushalayim into Golos, we sing the second line softly. Kina 31, Laman Allah. Eish tu kad bekir bi balosi alibi v'tzeisi mi mitzrayim v'kini mohin olemahan askiro v'tzeisi mi rushalayim Az yashir Moshe shir lo yinoshe v'tzeisi mi mitzrayim Gale yom romu v'chachoma akamu v'tseisi mi mitzrayim Zeitonim shatafu v'yarash itzafu v'tseisi v'yerushalayim Degan shamayim mitzor mayim v'tseisi mi mitzrayim Tzai see me mitzrayim, tzai see me mitzrayim, Kalonu zevas, 
standing, two points the Rav made about Elitzion before we say Elitzion. And then we're going to be going into the shear. Those who are at home, please stay with us. Rabbi Rosenberg is going to be giving us a shear on the themes of Tisha B'Av. And those, of course, who are at Shari Tzedek, we're going to be sharing, we're learning from Rabbi Rosenberg. What, what's very crucial about Elitzion, Elitzion is not the last of the kina. Eli means to continue to mourn, to continue to wail. There is no way that we can encompass, like Yirmiyahu Hanavi, it, it's a total calamitous destruction. Aleph to Tuf. He's used every letter of the alphabet, and he cannot encapsulate the depth of the destruction and the loss. That's exactly Elitzion. It's not the ending. We're saying continue to wail. Elitzion, what is the, the phrase that we keep, we're going to be saying again and again on page 611? I apologize one second. Elitzion vara kemo isha betzira. What is an isha betzira? Huh? It's a woman in childbirth. Now think about pre, even, even with the um, epidurals, but pre-epidurals. Do you know the excruciating pain of childbirth? You can't stop it. You can't control it. It is such a pain. It's so acute. There's nothing worse, no, no more acute concrete pain. And it, we can't stop it. Can't stop. Can never be. There's no nichum. There's no way of being assuaged from that pain. But at least if it's the pain of childbirth, at the end there's something positive. There's a child. After all that pain, there's a child. It's a new life. It's a future to the Jewish people. It's a living human being. A tzalem elokim. That's why the next line says, It's like that young girl. You think about Yaakov and Rachel, right? They've been waiting for years to get married anticipating, yearning. And then the night of the wedding, no sooner does he leave the chuppah, he drops dead. They're never together. The, all that yearning, that life that they were going to build together, that whole hope. So it's the pain, it's the acuteness of childbirth. But there's no child. There's no future. There's nothing good that's come out of that pain. Only hurt and mourning and suffering. And that's our feeling. We're not ending the kinos. Elit Sion says we cannot encapsulate the pain and suffering that we've had throughout the millennia. We only pray that this is the last Tisha B'Av. The last Tisha B'Av that we have to say, Elit Sion. Shupach, Kimome, Yoreho, 
Good as a 